Hi, this is Damien Mariathope, and I'm an axological atheist. And I'm here with a guest, Dr. William Kelleher. And he is an axiological atheist uh, and a practices formal axiology. And he's going to tell us about it. I am very excited to give you our guest. So could you oh, go good ahead morning. and good morning. Good morning, Damien. Uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, you want to start with questions and, and I see if I can answer what you have to say. OK, well, um, the first thing I would like to know is um, because other people are not familiar with you, could you tell us um, just about yourself, like your schooling or whatever, or or your life, whatever you want to say? Does I'm not just what you think is important about you. I think that you're a very important person, and I would like more people to know about you. So tell us about you. Well, I'm a I'm a political scientist by profession. I have a PhD in political science from the University of California, Santa Barbara, which I got a long time ago. And I write books about uh, uh, American politics, and uh, that includes what you can call social ethics or or social public morality. And uh, sometimes it's called normative political science. So I'm I'm uh, interested in. The facts about uh, political systems and in the norms by which political systems can be governed. That's very interesting. Uh, I, yeah. I've written several books, and uh, one of them uh, uh, is called Progressive Logic, and that deals specifically with social policy. Yeah, I, I, I um, saw that uh, um, you had posted a thing on academic um, articles um, about the progressive logic, and I was very impressed with um, the uh, the thing that you laid out with axiology uh, of how to do the uh, a good uh, system. I really think that, um, as far as political, I mean, like how, what a government, in a sense, sh should um, be trying to do for the people and stuff. I thought it was really excellent. Um, so, do you use um, formal axiology, or um, what is your relation to it? Uh, yeah, um, I, I write from the point of view of formal axiology, uh, which is a, uh, a system of thought developed by a guy named Robert S. Hartman. And, uh, uh, he defined, uh, uh, he defined the word good and the structure of values. And, uh, with that, Knowledge of the structure of values, value situations can be analyzed to see where there are value consistencies and inconsistencies. Huh. And um, since uh, we're atheists, could you explain how um, you would uh, use that system to evaluate the concept of God? Uh, well, I'm glad you said concept because... That's the first thing, uh, the, the first word I would use to describe the idea. And uh, since it's a concept, uh, it depends on who's defining it and how they define it. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't have any um, any favorite definition for for that concept. Uh, in fact, I. I, I call myself actually a joyful atheist uh, <laughs> because um, I don't have to worry about this old guy in the sky who's going to get me when I die, you know, <laughs> and, and so I, I have this great relief. Uh, I was raised a Catholic, um, but have long since um, set that aside, and, and uh, I've been, a, because I'm scientific-minded, I've, I've been an atheist for a long time. Well, that's very great. So, um, what what was when when, yeah. when when did you become an atheist, and what was the point that um, made that um, solid for you? Oh well, it was uh, it was a long process. Um, I I I went to a Catholic elementary school in Chicago, and. Um, while I was a, I think around eighth grade, the Pope said, um, 
it's okay to eat meat on Friday. And and that just shocked me because um, before that time, anybody who ate meat on Friday, your soul would go to hell and burn for eternity. <laughs> and then I thought, my God, what about all these people who ate meat yesterday? Oh, wow. And their soul's going to burn in eternity, but today it's okay to eat meat. And this guy in Rome can make that decision? And that just started me questioning all religion and uh, all all, the, all religion as a source of morality and God and all that stuff. And so uh, it wasn't a, after that, it, it was a gradual process where I, I, I went through a phase of being agnostic, you know, not sure. Yeah. And being a deist, like, like maybe there's God is nature or something like that. And finally, uh, that God is nothing more than uh, a character in books and, and a mythical character in books, a superhero. And, uh, that's it. So he's not my superhero, and he's other people's superhero, and and I I don't think about it a lot. <laughs> well, that's really great. So that brings up to me, um, I am definitely an axiological atheist, and it brings up for me, to me, if you understand value as a real thing in the world that we can assess, we can utilize, and we can um, then um, understand how to you know, in a sense, delve our morality or build our morality from or or connected to value, then it things like concepts that don't have a real substance, a real dignity, a real value, a real rights, a real worth or anything. I mean, that to me means automatically that um, it's irrelevant that you talk about. So to me, that's an apatheist. An apatheist uh, is a type of atheism because once you don't believe in a god, you're automatically everyone's an atheist. So in a sense, most people say they're agnostic. They don't believe in a god, thus they are in a sense like de facto atheists. Because atheism is, do you believe? Well, if you say I, I don't know, well then you don't believe. It's automatically just the the property of yeah. belief. That, that that's sense. right. Yeah. So, anyways, but that's beside the point. So what I'm saying is, I I do believe that for me, an axiological atheist would start at apatheism. In other words. Why would I even care about your fantasy characters? It's not relevant. How does that affect my real morality? Now, how does that affect how I treat my children? You know, how does that affect how I, you know, whether or not there's a God? It should not be the thing. And then if there is a God and it is not pro-human, why would I want it to be part of me? And to me, to be pro-human would be to support human equality and human liberation, human freedom, human dignity. How can I have all those things if a god can tell me how I don't have rights or what my rights are? Then I don't have dignity because obviously it can be violated at any moment by the god's will. I don't have a, a real will because in a sense, it's either I do it or I'm punished. So there's not really any other second choice. So it's, you know, it's not like... You could love the God, or you could be, you know, your own person. Either choice you make, but loving the God, you get this benefit of, a, like you said, a superhero. Yeah, yeah, but it's not that. It's you have to do the God's will, supposedly, or else you're tortured, die, suffer. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. So to me, it, it automatically means it's an anti-humanist. To me, the God concept is anti-humanist yeah. because it says that my will is better than human. Yeah, I agree with that. The that. Uh... In religion, God is more important than people. Mm -hmm. And so people are necessarily reduced in value. And that starts a whole lot of problems right there. Because if you're, you're not so hot because God is supreme. And if, and if you're not so hot, then anything I do is, uh, is justifiable and, and, Wars or exploitation, labor exploitation, uh, gender exploitation. What's the difference? Because uh, you're nothing but uh, an inferior to God. So uh, if once you reject God, then you expose yourself to all moral issues. And and uh, you have to make decisions now. If if there's no God, what's going to be important? Yeah, well, that that definitely brings us up to the the other thing I wanted to do with our topic is, 
is now is to get into the actual um, axiology and philosophical things. So the, the topic of what I wanted to address is um, basically philosophic axiology, which is what I mainly use, which is value theory, and then scientific axiology, which I use a lot of precepts from, but I don't follow 100%, which is formal axiology, which is I know what you said you do. And then axiological atheism, which is can be any of the above. It just means that you're an axiologist, in a sense, and an atheist, which is what both of us are. <laughs> and then there's um, basically what I want to address is atheistic or naturalistic morality, which is, I think, what we both do. And mm -hmm. so um, the, what the, I thought the best way to be uh, um, address this would be to take the challenge head on from, you know, a religious uh, philosopher wanting to say that, you know, we can't do morality in a sense without mm -hmm. God and religion or Christianity particularly. So mm -hmm. this is the, he lists these as questions for atheists having a mm -hmm. standard of morality because he thinks mm -hmm. that if we want to say we do that we have to defend it, which I'm fine to defend it. So the person that gave these questions is Matt Schlick. For anyone who doesn't know, he's a president and founder of Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. Uh, and uh, Matt earned his bachelor's degree in, also in social science from Irvine, California. Anyways, he has a master's in divinity. Anyways, not, anyways he has, we can go on and on about him. All I wanted to say is so you get the point that, that he, he feels... He, he can give the best challenge. So that's why we're going to take him on. Number one, he right. says, objective standard. Do you have objective standards of morality by which you can judge whether or not something is morally right or wrong? And then I added to that, is morality subjective, objective, absolute, or relative to you? And then you can answer it, then I'll answer it. All right. Well, uh... First of all, I like your term, um, atheist, axiological atheist. Right. Because, because if you become an atheist, then you're confronted, like I said before, with all the questions of axiology. Right. What's, what's valuable and, uh, what are, what are the proportions of value or relations of value? And those are axiological problems. So just by becoming an atheist, you become an axiologist at the same time. As to the, the, there's a lot of things you said there. So I'll just take one word, which is the objectivity. Right. Uh, I don't believe in objective knowledge and I don't believe in objective morality. The, the uh for me people are responsible for what morality they develop and live by and so the the one of the key points for morality is to be committed to a system christians are committed to a system the system of christianity and however that's defined and in order to have any kind of morality which has a public effect, which is different than a person's individual morality, but a public effect <clears throat> requires commitment to the principles <clears throat> that define the morality. So there's no morality. If everybody dies, there's, there's not going to be any morality there, right? There's, there's going to be a universe. There's going to be air, water, and that stuff with no humans. But there's not going to be any morality because morality is a human concern and uh, really is an essential element of human culture. So uh, there's there's not an objective morality. Objective morality means it's there after everybody's dead. And, and a Christian might say that because God is the source of morality. And so everybody's dead and, and God's still there. So morality's still there. But if you don't have any God up there, if everybody's dead, there's no morality. So forget, I, I don't, I don't buy into the objectivity argument at all. Okay. And, um, I, I'll, I will say that, um, first, let me just explain what I see morality. 
when the word morality to me, I will say to me, is an overarching like um, sub uh, heading of all the, the genuses that come under it. In other words, mm -hmm. values to me then is the next or the, the core thing closest to what mor the morality is. All, all things that we then say are become moral start at what we presuppose is its value. So to me, an axiologist is a person who is aware that there is a necessity to identify, to classify, and then utilize this presupposition of value in a, in a way that's um, not haphazard. Because most people, they just haphazardly value things here, here. Where we stop, is it value? What is its value? Where does its relation play? What does that mean? And so it, it, it puts a bunch of core things then from that, like, foundation, which they try to say their foundation is God, our foundation would be, like, the, the analyzing the rationalism, the empiricism, you know, it's, it's the axiological facts that are involved. And then, so that's, first off, I would just want to clarify that. These values go first, before any morality can be done, to me. The next thing is then morals. And I'd classify morals different than I classify ethics. Morals to me are your personal decisions of how you personally live your life. Like when someone says the thing of virtue ethics. Virtue ethics is do what's virtuous. But in a sense, that's a personal moral. You can't push virtue on other people in a sense. What you do is you hold them to accountability for not violating others. So that's not virtue, though. But so then there's ethics, which ethics is the... Um, the social, it involves other people. And to me, this is why there's a such thing as a business ethics and not business morals. There never is. They have, they teach ethics in college to everybody. They don't teach morals because they understand to me without maybe understanding it. They haven't, I haven't heard it said that often is that there is a difference between morals and ethics. And the difference is personal is morals and ethics is social. It's with everybody else. It's the, Involvement. This is really important to me because there's a confusion. All religion usually gives is morals, but it tries to say that it can use these personal morals to become this absolute universal social ethics, which that can't be because they're not grounded on a social ethic. They're grounded on a personal will, the will of the deity, the will of the one person, the leader, the whatever. So yeah, ethics ethics to me and morally is different. So then I also have a problem when people say objective because I think objective um, really has to be classified. I use objective when I say there's an objective fact. It means objectively that outside of myself, a thing can be true. But the proposition can also be true through logic, which is why I use value theory because I can look at a proposition and say it's good and make a judgment in, in and of itself. In other words, it's usefulness. Because I think that there's sometimes is normative ethics, then there's things that are not normative. And they get into this theoretical ethics about possibilities and stuff. All that really is still, um, to me, attaching to the core, what is the value? And see, the, and if, the, if I ask you, do you value humans? Your question um, to me should be, why should I? And what value do humans um, potentially have. Mm. Why does that make them better than others? And to me, I think that, they, so those are all questions that we should have to be able, in a sense, have some sort of an objective answer. In other words, if you and me both say humans have worth because they have an advanced intellect or an advanced emotional structure or that, you know, because that um, they're aware of time ratios, as other animals, in a sense, could be not. So it could, or you could base it on pain, the fact that we're feeling beings. See, this that, that's an objective fact. We're a feeling being. Now, that doesn't mean, I agree with you, I not does not mean, I think, that, that morality is always objective. That would be the most insane thing ever. An objective um, appraisal of human ability to... Uh, maximize uh, choices would immediately show that we're fallible as hell. So even if there could somehow together as a group make some objective, every single moral was objective, 
I'm telling you right now, none of us are able to hold to that standard and have every single choice at every single time, in every single way, under every single condition, objected. That is insane. So that I agree with you. Anyone who thinks that you are always... But I think in general that there's a problem that we've done is we would like to generalize. I don't think it's right to say morality is objective. I don't think it's right to say morality is all subjective. Because every moral fact should be based on the situation, the people, the things, the assessment of value. You can't say that one and 10,000 is the same. Objectively, I can say it's not. So I think this is it. But to me, um, axiology starts at the presupposition of the one doing the ethics. In other words, like you said, there is no, if all humans die, there will be no more morals because we make it 100% of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. so, so, in a sense, th th grasping that, that would mean, if you understand it the way you're saying it, you're correct. And as an axiologist, the first thing would be it's subjective to reality in a sense mm -hmm. that if you remove humans. But see, that's like saying, well, love would not be existing in the universe if all living beings that felt love were no longer existing. But see, that's kind of, um, to me, almost like a way of philosophically saying um, we don't have to assess its value. Because we should assess even the value of our statements, to me. Is the statement I just said a morally true statement, a beneficial statement, a worthy statement? Because I don't see axiology as just limited to good. I see it good, worth, value, it has beauty, um, it has to do with um, beneficialness, like how, how useful. Because, I mean, there's a difference in useful, like of, of vegetables or of all vegetables, but yet salad, you know, is not going to be the same as broccoli. There has to be a way of assessing this. Objectively. So I think that there's, a, there's a problem is the only reason, like you said, the reason why there's this humongous uh, uh, thing about objective and subjective is really not because atheists are having a problem with understanding how to apply morality, because if there was, then it would be some drastic murders and mayhem, you know, everywhere. So we're no, like you said, it's very astute that you brought that point up. The only reason we have this obje objective, you know, subjective thing really to the extreme level that, that it's done, it's not really because of philosophers. To me, I agree with you. It's because of religion. It's because of religion is hijacked, you know, or tried, attempted to hijack morality 100%. That almost like they, and they always say it all the time, without God, without this religion, without, you know, how could you possibly even know how to be moral, you know? Really? You don't, you, you, you would burn and torture children if you didn't have a God tell you not to? What if a God tells you to do it? Would it, would it be moral then? So to me, they don't even have an absolute to themselves because they, they, they're liars. They, they're, they're saying they're objective, then they're not because you and me both know everybody's made this up. And then in a sense, it, we can make objective um, positioning in that subjective reality. In other words, like I think the axiology, the concept of cup, right? The concept of cup is, a, is a, 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 a thing that can hold a substance well in a sense, you know, usually liquid. You know, if it has a hole in the bottom, it's not a good cut. That's an objective fact you and me both can agree on. <laughs> and in a sense, we can use that, to me, I agree, we can use that, though, that of those objective facts to then position, well, then we know certain things because it's usefulness. Because a cup given to a fish is nothing. If you put it in its fish tank, it's just another weird-looking rock, in a sense, to, to it, its concept. Maybe it understands more, maybe it could, but I'm just saying in general, though, so it's goodness, the goodness of a cup to us, or goodness of a car, or a goodness of, you know, um, let's say a tool of some kind. It's goodness, though, is positioned to its particular use. So, you know, uh, uh, we could say uh, a screwdriver, flathead screwdriver is a great tool. We could axiologically say it has a bunch of uses, but see, it's not good as painting. Although you could paint, you know, a whole wall with just a flathead screwdriver. It would take you forever, but it, it's possible. <laughs> but see, that, that, that would be an improper use, and we can both say, right, that that's not a good use. We can axiologically say that is not a good use of that tool. And to me, that's how at some, some morality, in a sense, that's not a good use of your social behavior. 
to punch people in the face or to, or to call them names or whatever. That's not because it's hurting the, the social cohesion. Then the problem is you are always living. You cannot be outside of, in a sense, unless you live somewhere in the middle of nowhere in, in you know Alaska or something. I mean, in a sense, you're always dealing with people. So we have to have morality. We're, we're, there's no way that we can choose to, in a sense, not. Because the moment that you choose not, you've just committed a moral violation, in a sense, because, or ethical violation. It has a moral, what I mean by that, is a moral like error that's now allowing you to cause ethical violations, is what I really mean. And we know, you and me, that axiologically, the presupposition is you stopped valuing. Then because you stopped valuing, your morals changed, thus it allowed you to then make ethical harm to others, <laughs> in a sense. Yeah, so when you, when you reject the idea of objective ethics or objective values or objective mor morality, then you have a problem of uh, what they call the relativity of value, or are all values relative? And you use the word subjective. Are all values subjective? Is everybody free to have their own idea about anything? And and are there no moral principles that that you can use to gauge whether one value is more valuable than another? And and that's a problem that um, atheists have to deal with uh, uh, because. <clears throat> There isn't, there isn't an atheist ethic, uh, that's commonly accepted. And so religions, uh, like you said, the religions have, uh, commandeered the field of morality, uh, and, and have everybody thinking if you don't have religion, you don't have morality. And so atheists have a, it's almost like a public relations problem. <laughs> that's uh, a good point. <laughs> we, we don't have, we, we don't have God, so, what do you have for morality? And, and that problem hasn't been settled. There's, the problem is still totally up in the air. And there's uh, many different voices saying many different things, but it is, we don't have a settled, uh, uh, solution for that. You know, like the, like the Christians have the Ten Commandments and, and they can say, here's our morality. What do you got? Exactly. And, and, and we can't say anything, but, uh, you know, it's it's up everything is up to you well that's not that's not a responsible position and so we have to deal with that uh, problem and um i think the the for me the only solution to the problem of relativity of values is that you formulate principles and then you commit yourself to the principles like for example, this country is, has a constitution, and and the guys who wrote the constitution, it has certain principles in there about separating powers and and having powers uh, balance each other out and dividing up uh, areas of government. So they committed themselves to those principles, and it's just a matter of commitment. You say, "We're this is what we're going to do," and and we're sticking to it. And so the same procedure has to follow for the development of any kind of a social ethic. You, you have to say out, you know, first it, you, you discuss the principles that you agree on the principles and then it's a matter of commitment and, and commitment means you, you stick to it. So that's the problem, uh, facing, uh, atheists now, uh, I, I mentioned uh, the, the book that one of the books that I wrote, uh, Progressive Logic. So I do that. I, I discuss that problem and I, and I discuss, uh, a principle that people can intellectually commit themselves to. And then I say, if you, if you choose to make that commitment, then these are the logical points that follow from it. And the book is based on the logical points that follow from it. Otherwise, it's just you got your opinion, I got my opinion, and everybody else got their opinion, and we're going to fight it out, or or it's going to be chaotic. And uh, unless we unless we have principles we can commit ourselves to, there won't be orderly thinking. 
So when you say orderly thinking, um, are you agreeing that there are moral facts, or do you not think that there are moral facts? Well, um, I'm not comfortable with the word moral with the term moral facts. Okay, okay. because uh, uh, so, so just to give you me, an idea, so is is uh, for me, I could say a moral fact is that uh, it's never just to do rape. Uh, well, uh, for me, I, that's the principle. I, 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 I see a distinction between natural science, which deals with facts, and value science, which deals with values. Is, 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 so, is a value a fact? Uh, you can have, you can value facts, and it's a fact that people have values, but it's two but, different areas of study. Well, no, I, I, yeah, I, well, I'm not saying I'm definitely not saying that um, even if something is was was a moral fact that has anything to do with science. I'm I'm saying because it would be about the, in the area of philosophy to me. It would be it, or it, but but it, it depends. Well, it, actually, I take it back. No, I take it back because if you use it as a social science, I could see that you could say that. In other words, like it. it let me explain by facts how I see it because I think once again words how they're used really. Can people say the same word? Not like to me. Now it depends on who's saying moral fact. I guess what they mean by that. But how I would see it is there are such things as moral facts. The thing is that there. What we're what I would be saying is there's an axiological fact that then has a uh, connected um, uh, morality or ethic to it. In other words, um, if I um, see you drowning, right? And uh, and I'm standing there and it can help you. Am I in mm-hmm. any way morally obligated to help? If you're asking for help, can I can I just stand there and watch you drown? And am I culpable? Not legally. I'm talking about morality. Morally, mm-hmm. do I have anything to help you? How about and if you say no, does it change if you're the parent? Do you mm-hmm. feel that a parent? Can I say that a parent? has an obligation to reach out and put their hand to grab the child? Or is there no moral facts that no parent is obligated morally, not legally, morally to help their child? See, I think it's an absolute... And to me, everyone talks about ethics. I What I never hear enough about is care ethics. I have rarely heard a person alive deny the core of care ethics that a person who is the caregiver has a moral fact obligation to that person they care about i have never heard someone give a strong argument about why that's not so and i don't care what you feel your morality is not you personally i'm just saying all the people like i don't because in a sense and but see what we're really appealing to is a hundred percent natural because naturally, evolutionarily, the the parent, the mother, whatever, generally uh, has been, um, you know, uh, through a process of evolution, the ones that care for children, they their children generally survive. And thus, yeah. you know, caregivers becomes just the, the model. We, in other words, you can't get outside of it. It's not do we care. We're social beings. We can't not care. And in fact... Yeah you can see the the problem that happens when people kill people. Most people get PTSD. Most. Most people cannot kill others and not be affected. They just can't. I mean, even people that are, that are, are even psychopaths sometimes have nightmares because, once again, their moral disgust, there is no, nothing external. It's a fact about our biology, our, our, how our brain and whatever processes psychologically. I mean, because there, I mean, I mean, my biology, in case people think that I'm trying to attach something I'm not, it is a fact that biologically, when we interact with other people, we feel oxytocin, we feel other biological chemicals. These biological chemicals, it is a fact, make us want to bond with others. So this, what I mean, so that shows that there's evolutionary biological reasons to morality in a sense. I'm not saying they are moral. Just, these are the, the, the core things that give us this motivation. Why everybody can't get outside of, in a sense, a moral fact, caring for, for the, you know, their children generally. 
because mm-hmm. it, it, you know, animals do it. It's 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 in us. We're hardwired in a sense to do that. So when I see someone violating that, I don't feel like it's a problem in a sense to say you've made a moral error, and that's a moral fact that I can hold in a sense position against people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I like what you said about uh, moral emotions and and having been uh, a, uh, developed through evolution, and and I I, uh, I I agree with that. And the way I understand it, um, uh, over the over the eons of evolution, people who contributed to a group. Uh, had mating privileges that uh, people who are antisocial didn't have. So they gradually, uh, our brain was developed for emo- uh, moral emotions, to mm, feel yeah. like making a contribution more than to feel like uh, stealing all the food that the people have gathered and keep it for yourself, you know. I think that uh, group supportive behavior uh, was favored as a mating principle and that antisocial behavior was disfavored as a mating principle so that human breeds were were bred like you'd breed cattle human breed human beings were bred to have uh moral emotions and to have a, a, a more sort of a moral attitude not any specific principle but just the emotional attitude, the tendency yeah. to all the th- things that you said to understand that killing, taking somebody's life or torturing somebody or rape, that there's somehow it, it runs contrary to your feelings. Uh, even if you don't have a principle, That's it right. runs contrary to feelings in most normal people. Yes. You know, even some non-normal people, I was saying, still suffer. So that we still are obligated by this biology, by this yeah. evolutionary thing. And so when they say that's why it's it's odd because in a sense they're asking a a nonsensical question. How do you do morality? We should in a sense go back. How do you not? Because uh-huh. in a sense everyone would at least agree to to care ethics. Because like uh-huh. you said, it's it's almost pro socially. We have no. It, in other words, also. To me, it's there's health benefits for caring. There's health benefits for being pro-social. There, there just mm-hmm. is. I mean, it's already been proven. So there's a lot of benefit to do it biologically. It, it makes us healthier. It improves well-being. It improves our social, you know, um, cohesion with others. Which is this is also another point, like you said about antisocial. Not only do you not mate, but we already know that the more that you're antisocial, the more it almost creates a mental imbalance. You know this because put someone in solitary confinement. Do they come out normal? They usually uh, suffer in there by themselves. So it shows that we're so social beings that our isolation harms us psychologically. So, in other words, you could give a person in in solitary confinement all the food they need, all the water, all the air, even give them the largest space they want, but all by themselves they would still suffer psychologically because we need humans. We, we need other people. It doesn't mean that everybody needs a thousand people. Sometimes maybe you only need one. But boy, when you have, and it doesn't have to be even like, oh, and I mean, it doesn't have to be a mate. It could just be a friend. How much we really need social cohesion. So like you said, because we need social cohesion, it automatically to me means we need values. Once we need values, we need to apply the ethics. It's just the, is the, in other words, to me, ethics is the end result that you had a good axiology. <laughs> you you valued things and people, and then you treated others accordingly in, a, in an ethical way. Mm. So that's why I think it's yes. it's very important to become an axiologist, or at least to understand and utilize axiology because of the benefit it gives to your entire life. Yeah, yeah. So I I uh, I agree with a lot of what you've been saying about uh, the biological benefits and the and the biological uh suffering that that you have uh from isolation and that and the benefits of a uh, more health and happier life and that sort of thing around other people and um i would i would take that as a baseline 
is against the the charge of the relativity of value. Yeah, you're right. I would take that biological experience as a baseline. It's it's not it's not easily proven. Yeah. But it's intuitively uh, apparent, and and using that. That emotional baseline, I would say. So, how can we develop principles that can be logically and, and articulated and agreed to uh, that are consistent with the intuition, the biologically based intuition? That's that's a beginning point, but then you have to elevate that to an intellectual level where people can discuss a principle mm -hmm. and, and right. analyze and criticize it. And then you have a moral system when it's when it's something you can articulate with principles that you can make inferences from and deductions from and and criticize. So I think that's a second problem uh, based on all the things you just said about a uh, a biologically based moral tendency in people. Yeah, and um, I uh, have a, a degree in psychology, so this stuff really interests me too. And that's actually how I started uh -huh. to get into axiology to begin with. Is uh, uh -huh. I, I went to school to be a drug and alcohol counselor. <laughs> that's what I thought. I was a truck driver. Didn't, I had been injured. Didn't really feel that great. Didn't want to do it anymore. Eventually, I went back to try it again, but then I had to quit because I just couldn't do it. But when I went to college. Um, they started talking about ethics and uh, and I became an atheist in college. But then when they brought up ethics, uh, I started now thinking like you were saying, like, well, how do we know that? Or how, how do we get value? Or how are we sure that we're not just equally wrong? <laughs> you know, or how are we sure that it's not good to, you know, uh, do this or do that? I started really like, wait a minute, you know, you're, especially to me in the class, they told me, pick the ethic that you like. That did not sound ethical. What? Mm -hmm. Because I was like, well, there was a big problem because in the class that they, they, they didn't go into any in depth, but they they showed us the different you know types of of morality, and some of them were completely contradictory. So mm -hmm. I, how can that be possible that we can pick any of them? And that I said, there's there's no way of judging which one is better than others. I'm not saying that one is right, everyone else is wrong. But can't we like say like top 10, like this is the top and then these others are, you know, honorable mention or whatever, you know, are still still acceptable, you know, but may not yeah. be the best choice. I mean, there's no way to evaluate morality. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that no, that doesn't work for me. No, no. that's why I started that's looking. Relative. Yeah, I started. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Well, even if it's relative, how do we know that relative is not wrong? I mean, I, once I, I, I didn't bother me. So I started looking into uh, epistemology and axiology. And I, once I found axiology, I go, oh, okay, this is a lot better. Plus, I was also at the time saying I was a, a, a spiritual atheist because I thought spiritual meant you had morality. You know, I didn't or you could see morality by connecting the value of things in the world. But once I had axiology, oh, I don't need spiritual no more. I got this new better world, you know, this word that actually is talking about really, you know, substance of what I want to talk about. Then I found out that there actually, actually was um, axiology and atheism together. It wasn't something that I made. It was something that someone else had already talked about. So I was like, wow, how awesome. I never even heard about this term. And then there's actually a whole philosophical way of thinking about it. <laughs> this is cool. You know, and then I started doing more searches. And that's when I found you. And I thought, oh, man, here's someone who's talking all the same stuff. And he's saying, you know, and I know he's got to be an atheist because I heard what he said about God. <laughs> and so um, that's why I'm really, you know, um, honored to be talking with you now. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And so and I, and I really, you know, I push axiology on this general public now because of my atheism like all the time. And I have put your name out there a whole bunch. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I totally. Well, I, I think you're you're a great guy, and I think that you're an asset to our community. Oh, thank you. The atheist community, I mean. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, and you might well, be surprised. Uh, you only have 300 friends now well, on Facebook or whatever, and something like that. You might be surprised after this video. You may have oh, a few more if you want. Oh, well, that'd be nice. Yeah. 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 I. Uh, I'm a member of a of a atheist or or 
non-believer, they call themselves group, called the Center for Inquiry. And uh, they just merged with, um, uh, oh shit, what's that, uh, the scientist, the selfish gene? Oh, Richard Dawkins uh, Foundation? Yeah, the Dawkins yeah, Foundation, yeah. that's right. The, our organization just merged with the Dawkins Foundation. And so I'm hoping that um, out of that merger, some effort will be made to try and develop uh, an ethics, a set of ethical principles that can be attached to atheism and socially acceptable and, and show some moral leadership. You know, the atheists don't show moral leadership and religion claims to have the position for moral leadership. So, so we, if we want to succeed as a, as a belief system, we need to develop a, a set of principles that will demonstrate moral leadership to people. Well, and even and like you said, belief system. Not going to do it. Well, even like Sorry? You, true. And I was going to, I agree, I agree with that totally. <laughs> and I would like to be involved with it. That's what I've been trying to do on my own. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to instill in people the value of actually caring about values, the caring about morals, caring about ethics, caring about how we treat other people. That that is totally what I'm about, and mm -hmm. and that's why I I totally like I said I feel like you are uh, an asset, and I and I um and I I want to be an asset too, not because I want to be famous or anything, because I really care and I want to make a difference. And I really feel like that we, like you said, we need people to stand up and say, fine, I'll be an example. I'll be a leader. I'll be whatever. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not. But I'm willing to try to, to stand up and say this is what it's right to be a moral person as best as we can. We have flaws, but, I mean, there's a difference between – in other words, I feel everybody makes a difference. Everybody. Whether it's good or bad, everybody's constantly making a difference in the world. So I realized, well, wow, I can make my difference positive if I choose to, and I want to. I can make mine be uh, impactful to where I not only become a leader, but build leaders. That's what I want to do. I want to, you talk about moral leadership. I want to make everyone their own moral leader to where, where people feel empowered. To feel, it should be a pride to say I'm an atheist. I'm a person who lives by, you know, uh, ethical standards that are naturalistic. I mean, what other can they be to me but naturalistic? I mean, we can't appeal to, to a God, and we, why would we want to? Even if they, they could appeal to religion, why would you appeal to religion, which is inherently subjective in all ways, when you could at least start with some naturalist things that are objective to everybody? And even if, even if, even if people try to say this objective, I love this when people are our solipsists. Well, how you know reality is real? Okay. Well, then what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Because they themselves are saying that it's not real. But if it's not, then to me, everything pushes back to a pragmatic, axiological thing. Then we behave as if it is real, since it is all that we know. And it would be mm -hmm. safer, almost like a, a, a tw twisting, in a sense, the... Um, uh, what's it called? Um... Oh, I can't remember now. But it, it's it's where um, people try to say, you know, well, if you believe in God, you're better off than being an atheist. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called now. But um, it, in a sense, it's better off to live ethically with value, assuming the world is real, because it's all we have, than to live as if the world is fake and it be actually be real, then we were wrong. And then, then we've actually committed harm. Mm. So to me, this is also brings up another thing. Even it, let's just assume that the world to them is fake, but we know that we are psychologically in this world affected by even theoretical ideas. We are. We can make a theory that God's a theoretical idea, and people are terrified. <laughs> How about people like, like, like even Reformed Catholics sometimes, right? Live with like guilt, you know, come popping up in their life. It's all indoctrination. You were taught this 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 concept of guilt, and then it's been attached in them, and it was you know the God concept removed, but this guilt stayed attached. Mm -hmm. so it, it, but it, 
it it's not the way to me like just like the people talk about the golden rule that's a religious moral i i don't value that at all because i actually understand values and i understand so to me the god moral says what i like then becomes morals or ethics mm-hmm. the problem is it should be the value it shouldn't be what i like i mean i don't like um let's say liverwurst i would never produce that as a food <laughs> but yeah. but but my like makes no difference mm-hmm. of other people's use and it mm-hmm. shouldn't but no matter how much i don't like it i despise it tastes like i could even i wouldn't give the animals but the point mm-hmm. is cuz i hate liver <laughs> but the point is that's not an objective fact in the world that liver worse is bad. That's uh-huh. just me. So once I can identify the difference between my personal and something else in the world, then I can, I can start applying things more. So, but see the, 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 the morality of the golden rule says do unto others as you would do unto you. Yeah. But there's uh-huh. people in different places of the world that do unto me might mean kill my children because they believe in honor killing. It might mean allowing rape of captured victims, as it does in Muslims countries, some of them, especially with um, uh, ISIL. So, and he, in fact, I heard a female um, Muslim woman justify that she agreed that men, by the Quran, have the right in the you know to rape all the females. And then they said, I heard someone talk to her and say, well. You're a female. Would you? She says, if I was captured, then that's something that would I would expect. I, like, oh, that right there shows. Just like I did the same thing. What if someone's 16? Do you want a 16-year-old deciding that what the problems of the world? Do you want to go to war because of what a 16-year-old? So you do understand that their value, we can all look at and say, maybe we shouldn't. Or how about, you know, someone who's five years old? Would you let someone five years old? There, you know, because do unto others, do unto you, whatever they want to do, would that be okay with us? No, it would not. So to me, we already know. To me, that's why I say that we already know that it, intelligence has to be a factor in morality. So does moral uh, development and moral reasoning. Because because mm-hmm. morals is not like you said. It's not like some external thing we go find in the world. Oh, look, there it is. There's morals. No. So it it, it takes the process of thinking and reasoning to be able to do it, anyways. All right. So I, I totally agree with that. And, and, uh, so the, the problem that, that creates is then what are the principles you're going to use for your moral reasoning? Uh, moral reasoning is necessary, but how is it possible without certain principles that you can agree with? And, uh, that's what, so that's what I wrote about, uh, in that book in the, in progressive logic was a basic moral principle consistent with the biological tendencies that you talked about. And, and then the implications of that moral principle. Uh, let me, let me just say what that is. Um, so I start with a, with a principle and it's just an analytic principle. It's not something that you have to believe in. Mm-hmm. And it's that. All people always deserve positive regard. So I, it, the short version would be all people deserve respect, right? Right. Uh, now, I'm not saying that that's an obligation. I'm saying that's an analytical principle. Can I, can I just stop one question and, and ask? And start. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. What do you mean by persons? In other words, I agree with that axiologically for my even my thinking although persons to me could mean elephants could mean um high foot but i'm saying depending on well well, because i would call those for me personally just so people listening i think that those if you reach a high enough level of awareness to me i start Mm -hmm. to treat you different than, than animals that have a lower awareness so when i was i have a classification for me would be people as humans and then have mm-hmm. non-human uh, persons, which would be high-level animals, and then I would have mm-hmm. low animals, and then I would have animals without feeling, because mm-hmm. there's some insects that actually don't feel pain. I would thus axiologically put them at the, no, near the lowest level, and then animals that have no awareness at the lowest, and then things that have no awareness at all below that. 
as far as a, an yeah. axiological structure of where to place value. That's all I was saying. Mm -hmm. So for people that yeah. don't know, I know you probably, you probably already have this concept. I'm just bringing this out so people that are listening know when you say persons, I am assuming you mean humans. That's all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very important point because, uh, like, like in biology, uh, the, the axiology that I use distinguishes between humans as, as one category, a biological category and other categories of, of organisms. We're an organism. Right. But we're the human organism. Right. And so, uh, I, I, uh, I think it's important to, to distinguish uh, between the human organism and other organisms. Other organisms you can you can love, right? I mean, you can love your dog, you can love your cat, you can love your car, and so so there can be a distinction, and that doesn't mean the other the other classifications are worthless. You know, I'm not saying dogs or elephants are worthless or cars are worthless, right. but but there's the human category and that stands by itself Other categories you can have feelings about but it's it's not the same as the human category so the human category is the center of value you know Karl Marx once said that man is the supreme being for man and so it, without without Agreeing with everything that Mark said, uh, that uh, that principle for me yeah. is a basic ethical principle, and you can build other principles or derive other principles from that basic principle. I agree. That, 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 I, I was just mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't um, saying you were thinking anything different than what I I agree with what you said, everything you said. I was just wanting yeah. to clarify. Oh, yeah. Now, I wanted to come to clarify persons, that word persons, because I knew, uh, I know uh, in a sense what you mean by that. I want to make sure everyone else, uh, you know. Well, you know, you know where this is a real big problem is that the abortion issue. Yes, it is. And so, and so I, I talk a little about that in my book. Could you talk about and it I, now? And I, I mean, real, real, real quick, can you talk about it quick, real quick right now? Yeah. Uh, well, I go along with the Supreme Court decision in Roe versus Wade. But the, but the problem is person, a person is, is, how do you define a person? Because the anti-abortionists define a person at the moment of conception. And they talk about baby killers. You know, now this is a word problem because baby is something that you, sits on your lap That's and goes right. goo goo and da da. <laughs> and it's, it's a little thing, you know. That's a baby. And, and before that, there's an organism growing within a, a woman. But if it's a, still an organism, it's not uh, viable outside the womb. Uh, it's not a person. So the problem of defining what is a person for me is the central problem for abortion. Right. And so the Supreme Court sees uh, uh, a person as a, a viable, a fetus that can live outside the the womb and you start from there yes and then you got a person yeah well and see i i, I as far as the abortion issue you almost said exactly what i think my uh -huh. feeling is my feeling is this it doesn't become an axiological issue of that being um that's growing that that organism turns into a being i think for her so free i'll explain first i think it's just a bunch of cells then it becomes, in a sense, an organism. Then it becomes, in a sense, to me, a being, a beingness. But it's still not, in a sense, a person. It's just, it's be, it's becoming that. Like you said, the problem is, it's a gestation. So, yes, at some point, <laughs> before leaving the womb, this thing turned into something. But their problem is, they are acting like it's the thing the whole time. Um, yeah, that's right. No, yeah. it's not. So, yeah. I, so, my first thing, so this is the same part where I stand. My nothing is axiological to me. I have no regard for that that set of cells being whatever until axiologically it experiences pain. Once to me that being experiences pain, to me it starts to get personhood. 
In other words, we need to start treating it as something closer to human than it just was before for me. Because now it's in the realm of experience. And that we build most of me our morality in a sense is a juxtaposition of its pain level, its pleasure level. We, we, and I'm not saying that everything is hedonistic or something, but in the general, like a lot of our stuff could be grouped kind of loosely in that, those categories, in a sense, what we do to harm or help, you know. So it's really important, I think, to clarify all this stuff like we are. And then it's really important. Um, I want to give out to atheists because, like you said, we don't talk about it. And, and these, the issue is that, the the lie the religion and God believers do is that somehow they have a magic bullet this this you know we're lucky charm or something that that allows them to jump over all the axiology they need to do all the you know more reasoning they need to do all the ethical application they need to do and just say I do it because a block you know something I mean it's no you don't get to do that. In fact, even if your religion and God, well, I'm just saying to me, even if, let's just say your religion and God are all true, you still must do all the axiology in the sense and all the moral reasoning and then all the application ethically. So you're not under any less obligation than anyone is. So we're all yeah. in the sense, I think, doing atheist really morality because in a sense, all most people don't really appeal to the exact words, every word of the Bible, because they'd be killing more people. I mean, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the fact you're not killing people, the fact that your women are allowed to talk inside of churches and become pastors, the fact that, you know, that, like you said, that, that constantly the Catholic Church changes. I mean, you look at that, yeah, it's, just, it's a joke. They don't have morality. The truth is they never did. And like you're talking about is because they acted as if they could deny the axiology and just state things as true. Mm -hmm. They can't. Just to me, like knowledge or belief requires epistemological understanding. Mm -hmm. Values and morality, to me, require axiological understanding. Those yeah, that I agree. Those that understand axiology will apply morality a lot more efficiently. Those that don't will be subject to error because they're not, as you said, they don't have the standard. They don't, in a sense, understand the, because I believe that axiology is like, it's not just a meta ethics to me. And meta ethics is a thing in a philosophy, you know, like you study ethics. And meta ethics, in a sense, studies the ethics of ethics. And to me, axiology is even before that. It's like the presupposition that helps you understand and navigate your meta ethics to do the ethics that didn't apply, in a sense, or whatever. It's it's just, and that that goes back to look at how complicated it is, and they want a simple answer. Tell me if it's objective or subjective. If, you know, sir, you're asking a simplified, you know, answer to a massively multi-level explanation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in a sense, what we're doing right now is moral reasoning. Yes. And, and we're taking apart moral issues. So one of the things I do is uh, I have this base principle uh, all, all persons always deserve positive regard, just as an analytic principle. And then one, one axiom that I can derive from that is that people are more important than things. Yes. Which is a logically consistent application. And another one is people are more important than systems. Yes. So systems I totally agree. are different than things, right? Yes, I totally agree. And so those are two deductions, and then you can apply those to situations in the world just for analysis. And you can see, you know, well, uh, in this in this system, like for the voting system, you know, where people are being used to vote as voters, right? But uh, but they're not getting the full benefit that people could be getting. We're going out and voting, and it doesn't really count anyway because the electoral college is there. That's right. And so, and so, the the people are being subordinated 
to the existence of the system. They the are. System. Oh, yes. And, and we're not, it's not a system that serves us. It's a system that abuses us. I totally and agree. So, axiologically, that's a problem. And see, and everything you say, I, I totally agree with because, well, yeah. I mean, ideologically, first off, I am a socialist, anarchist, collectivist, mutualist, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I'm not really easy because you're, it's not an easy thing to explain how I politically think. So I believe uh -huh. that socialism is important, but I don't like state socialism because I feel that the state becomes, in a sense, over people. I don't like uh -huh. that. So I'm an anarchist, I believe, that, and I also think anarchist in thinking. I do not let any idea, thing, become supreme. Everything needs to be challenged. Everything. Mm -hmm. My own ideas, especially. So to me, and then I need the axiology, because without axiology, how would I even evaluate which statements had a better, you know, thing? It, to me, it, it, it allows me to slow down, axiology does, slow down and look at everything has a different value and there's levels of value slow down don't just go every all pizza is the same is it can't we say that more people like pepperoni than <laughs> say buffalo wing sauce you know so even though we can say universally people are generalized every pizza is good but all pizza is not equally good and so i start slowing down my thinking all actions are not equally good. If an action only benefits one person or benefits 10,000 people, I, that is a difference I need to be aware of. Even if that one person happens to be my wife, my child. I still need to be aware. It doesn't mean, I believe in care ethics. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm now obligated to always, you know, I don't believe in um, that concept of the uh, universalist, or is it not universal? Um, Unitarianism, I think it is. Maybe uh, ethics. Yeah, well, no, I know mean, Unitarian ethics. I think it is where it says oh. that you always do for the greater good. Well, I don't agree with that. So uh -huh. you're saying that a mother has to let her child die because four other children need stuff. Two other oh. children. How many children is too much? This is important, though. We need to because I do think there's there has to be a. If I said your one child may die, but that antidote will save a billion people. I don't know that I would not say that I need to appeal to the larger number. I mean, at some point, that's why I think that we need to be, because I, I think of this in stages of, 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 of moral weight in a sense or the axiological the, the, um, quality it has. So if I say, it, it, can a mother, should a mother have to do it for one child? Well, no. How about two children? No. Three children? No. Four children? No. Five children? But there is a level to when it gets high enough. It's, in other words, to me, it's built its moral capital or its axiological accumulation weight. In other words, their singular never reached the level axiological of your child. Okay? In other words, the, 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 the value you've placed on your child as position to other children is always going to be higher. But I do believe that even though it's lower, let's say it's 100 to 1 or, or you know, 10,000 to 1, yeah, but if those ones that only count as one, if we have a billion of them, now they are more than your ten thousand in a sense. Mm -hmm. I think I, I'm just I'm not saying that I I'm giving people how much children are worth. I'm just saying we need to understand that it's not so simple. Everybody to me makes quick, really quick moral judgments. It doesn't think about any of the axiology involved, and so they keep making errors, or you know they're not benefiting the enough people, or they're not. Not building enough close, you know, cohesion to their uh, caregiving systems, because you said we don't have any standard. Then the one we do have, supposedly, is religion and God. Oh, please, that's not even a standard. That's like the anti-standard, you know. Yeah. So, like you yeah. said, it's really sad state of morality because philosophy doesn't want to say it in a sense it has the one true thing. Or, or, or in a sense, almost axiological, it sets which one's better. It just goes, here's a bunch of different things people believe. It doesn't, mm -hmm. to me, it, then you have um, religion saying, here is the only thing, and we can look at it and go, no, it's not. <laughs> Whatever that is, that's not really morality. It's something, maybe it's like advice giving or something, but it's not morality. Yeah. Then you have, like you said, atheists, or in general, to me, anyone not religious, 
we actually usually have to have some, you know, inner drive that really is the mm -hmm. motivating to look for our axiology, whether we know it or not. We have this inner thing. So in a sense, without realizing it, we automatically, in a sense, are appealing to three things to me. A, our biology. B, our psychology. And then the, the um, you know, C is our environment, what we've experienced. That's what we're, you know. Because that's all without, like you said, without making a rigid, you know, th you know, reasoned morals, you know, you know, concept and standard, and then that's all you anybody has <laughs> is this natural, you know, almost like a common sense thing of your own experiences and psychology. And yeah. I, but I think that's not a good way to do because if I said, is that how you would like to run things? This kind of haphazard. Or would you like to run things better? I mean, most people, it's like I always tell people, I laugh and they go, well, people like to be bad. No, no, people love ethics. They don't like to have them put on themselves, but boy, they love when other people follow them. I've heard, rarely heard for few people, even like think about prisons, even they have, you know, you don't snitch. So whatever. But my point is that's still an ethic, right? I mean, they're still saying an axiological value. Why do they want to not snitch? They're putting value on themselves. Hey, look, people, we all are, are the bad people together locked up in here. Our value has to be higher on us than them. So don't tell on and hurt us to benefit them, which still is axiology involved. But you and me are aware of what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to, um, so in a sense, the Christians would say we have no objective standard. So they, they would say, if we don't have one, right, how do we determine right or wrong? So I think this is, I think we've already addressed this, but I would like you right now, if I asked you, how do you determine right from wrong? And without, you know, like the thing of God and religion, so you know, you don't do, how, how do you figure that out? Well, I, I, like I said before, I, I reject their claim to moral objectivity <laughs> and, and um, for me like, uh, like I said I begin with a sense of the biological sense of, that I have a feeling that I have moral emotions I have a sense that beating up a little child is is bad you know or killing a bunch of people is bad it's a sense that I have and then I elevate that to the to a, a value principle that all people always deserve positive regard, even if you're angry at them, and and so I use that as a way to analyze value situations and base my own personal morality on that. And and so um, what you raised a, a difficult problem when you were talking about. Uh, what does a mother let her child go mm. to be killed or kill, you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and uh, uh, that's a very difficult problem, but we live in a, in a world the way it is. And sometimes you got to fight. Sometimes you have to defend yourself. Sometimes you have to kill somebody to defend yourself yeah. or, or to defend another person. Right. Uh, so, for me, the, in the, in the, my own personal moral system, it's always a, a axiological error to kill somebody, torture somebody, use somebody, but we're in a real life situation. And so sometimes you have to commit an axiological error in order to survive. Right. So there's, so I recognize value contradictions, but as a practical matter, sometimes you got to live with value contradictions. You can't always be totally pure, uh, a totally pure person. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, so for me, the important point, first of all, is clarity. Clarity about what you're doing. You know, like you're going to punch somebody, uh, it's, you're gonna, that's, that's abuse, and it's axiologically, it's, it's an abuse of a person, but it might be necessary because they're, they're trying to steal your car, or, or they're trying to, they're trying to choke you, or something like that, right? So, 
So in a situation, you might have to do basically what's wrong because there's a greater right involved. And that's a moral problem. Right. And and how I would explain it for people that um, don't understand, because I know that you probably are doing a lot of presuppositions you're not talking about. Because I, I know that people, in other words, um, when you make a moral statement, you have, a, like even when I do, I guarantee when I do, when I make a moral statement, I don't make it very um, loosely. And I have done tons of research and I have tons of science and philosophy to back it up and moral reasoning in general that I've, I've um, done. But the, the thing is that like when you when you say something, there's a bunch of stuff. So let me explain something. There's not like you're the way you said, like you said, the axiology involved. But when people hear that, I know they're thinking like as if there's only one choice, like there's a, the axiology just says good, right or wrong. No, axiology to me would look at a hundred different elements that are whatever go, going on and then assessed all that. There's several layers. You can't look at at, at, at the whole environment. You know, let's say Nazi Germany. If I show you a video and I see someone kill someone, is that okay? Well, if you don't know that was the Third Reich and, and it was, you know, someone being forced to kill them, mm. all you saw was the, the the small, you know, cutout of the person killing. You didn't know the context. That then changes a lot of stuff. So to me, in a sense, axiologically, it's not one thing. It's not because you've assessed the, the what's the value of the person? What's the value of me? Right. You've assessed what's the value of the situation? In other words, like what is in other words, punching someone? What is the punching someone going to produce? Because if it produces, in a sense, a good thing, then I can assess the axiology. I understand that you were talking about the axiology value of a person, which I agree. People also don't understand, like they'll say that I say a murderer still has, it has axiological value. They have axiological value as an ontological human being. In other words, axiology, I know that their status of human doesn't become dog, doesn't become tree, car, whatever. It never exactly. stops being human. Now, That's right. axiology yeah. is not limited to just the intrinsic value of the human. To me, it also is a systemic, their behavior, what they're producing. Mm -hmm. So if, if the person is, is, like you said, killing, trying to, or trying to say, I, I, we're in a room talking and someone came in, tried to kill you. If I were to, you know, just try to stop him and then kill him in the process, in a sense, I have done murder to me. But the murder, in a sense, axiology, um, is not in a sense violated. I know what you're talking about, but to me it's not violated because I didn't want to harm. My mm -hmm. effort was actually to defend or protect. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that that we have since in other words, if I understand axiology correctly, like you're I'm just trying to break down what you said because I, I I know what you said. I was trying to break it down for other people. So axiology would say like humans have value. That's that, that core principle in a sense. So, but that never changed. I didn't violate that by defending you. I still am aware that humans have value. In other words, I wouldn't kill him and feel like no, no big deal about it. I would go, wow, I shouldn't have killed, but I had no choice. But see, That's that right. is in my moral uh, awareness of the axiology never changing. The weight and value of the human didn't change. So even though I had to do it, I feel this feeling because my emotions are aware of the axiological weight of what that person was and that me doing that, what it meant. That's all I was trying to say. I, th I thought it was really good. I just wanted to explain to people. It's yeah. not no, simple. I, I agree with what you said. Yeah. yeah. It's, I'm just saying axiology is all these complex things it's analyzing or can analyze to help decide the moral decision in a sense yeah where where it's a well i think it's better even even this way to me axiology is so wonderful that's why christians try to use it because they mm -hmm. get that axiology is important what i want to do and I, that's why i want you to be more famous because i want us atheists out there going you're wrong your axiology is is being used improperly this is not how you do ethics, and this is why axiologically, not my opinion, but external of me, this is not the way you do things. Because you do know, I don't know if you know, but I, I don't know if you know or any people are listening, but there, um, 
there was a college, I believe, um, it's in Indiana. What is it called? And anyways, it's a Catholic college, I think. Anyways, a famous one. Which I can't remember now. I don't know why I can't remember. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yeah, I can't remember why I couldn't remember things right now. But anyways, Notre Dame. Like certain things I remember, and other things I don't. I'm the, I, I'm I'm a big picture person, not detailed. So any details uh -huh. that you get, you just feel blessed. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's not. I think concepts like big. I don't think you know details. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, the um. This guy at Notre Dame, he did an axiological study of the concept of God. And was it better to be an atheist or not be an atheist? And they, and they uh -huh. did um, three different um, doctoral people did, um, did things, and they concluded that it was better to believe in God. Of course. Ah. <laughs> what the? <laughs> yeah. and I, they didn't talk to me. Because <laughs> I can guarantee that they tried to give this weak... You know, watered down like straw men of what an axiological atheist would 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 put against the God concept. Yeah, yeah. bring me on. I'll tell you how bad the God concept is to me as an axiologist. I will I will eviscerate the God concept as anything moral, anything just, anything that we would even value as humans. Yeah. It's it's an anti value. It removes value of humans. It in in fact. It, it, the, like I said, the concept of self, any god, is that it's better than human by its nature. It's That's so, right. Yeah. So, and, and, and automatically, we're supposed to be beholding immediately that this glory of this thing, it's disgusting to me. Especially as an, as mm -hmm. an anarchist, but... <laughs> yeah. But anyways, um, I think I wanted to talk about... Um, was how I know that sometimes they just go, oh, well, you're just talking about desire fulfillment. You're not really talking about some intrinsic value in the world. You're just talking about doing what you like, what appeals to you. And what would you be your um, response back to that? Uh, well, I, I separate hedonism mm. from, from the analysis of uh, values, right? So, uh, I, I'm not a hedonist, <clears throat> but I don't think that's I don't think that's got a lot to do with uh, with axiology itself. If you if you take uh, humans as the highest value, uh -huh. and and you say that people are more important than things, people are more important than concepts or systems. Which would mean God, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, or that, religion that beliefs. You still have a, you still have a lot of choices about how to live. Yeah. And so, and so, you could be a hedonist. I don't think it's a good way to live, where you're just pursuing your own pleasures. You know, uh, that would run into a problem in your relationships with other human beings. Right. If you if you take like, like a Don Juan type who's who says I'm a hedonist, and I want to have use women for as much sex as I can get, you know? Right. Well, so there's a problem there because then you're, you're using people as an instrument and probably involved with deception. And, uh, and so, and so there's violations of the principle that, that all people always deserve positive regard when you, when you lie to somebody in order to get them to give you sexual favors, you're, you're, reducing their value and treating them like an object. So axiologically, there's some problems there, uh, and that would inhibit my own behavior. Uh, so so it, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, uh, it, when people talk about pursuing pleasure, uh, there's limits to, you know, I think that what, what people can do, but then there's some elements in it that are correct. Yeah, well, I think that you, you, you brought up a good point because you're talking about, um, like the thing of consent. And I do think that that almost is what changes it. I mean, it is something, a good act, like you're talking about, um, involves sex. Axiologically, I would say, well, in a sense, to me, sexuality between humans that are adults only, I'm not talking about children, just adults, between adults to me, is almost amoral in the sense that as long as we don't do anything, it's you can't make a moral judgment. Is this 
Like, is, is, you know, this type of sex bad, this type of sex good? As long as it's consensual, and like you said, there's no lying, there's no, this, I mean, as long as it, then to me, it's not, it doesn't have a, a moral judgment. It's, it's, it just yeah. is. It's like saying, because what reminds me to me, we've made this biological thing, like, more value than it really should give in a sense, because of religion. Mm-hmm. And I mean, food too. People like get so, you know, like how many religions care about what you eat? Like most of them. How many care yeah. about how you have sex? Most of them. How many care yeah. about these? But that's not values. That's just some nonsense. Because yeah. really what you said is the point. It shouldn't be what you're doing. Is it consensual? Are the people aware? And that goes back to, I think, consent. Because if you're not aware, then you really couldn't give consent. <laughs> you know? That's <laughs> how could you give consent? You didn't even know what was going on. No one, you know, you know, so if I knock you out and then say, well, I read you your rights. So, you know, you're good. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't aware that because I, I wasn't even awake when you did it. <laughs> so I think that, that and I think that same thing goes with morality, though. We can't make morally aware decisions because we need moral reasoning if we're not aware. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> And another another problem similar to what we just talked about would be euthanasia. Yeah. And and um, if 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 uh, consent makes sexual relations between adults sort of amoral. Yep. Then why why can't somebody consent to to being uh, killed uh, because they're in pain or because they have some incurable disease or something like that? Why isn't uh, I think it is. I think it should be. So yeah. I mean, if it's if it well, because because well, I it, start, I well, and just like t- talking about, I think it's real important. You and I forgot. I do this a lot. If I didn't think about what it is though, you talked about um, having that. I can't remember what you said the concept. I I don't know why my brain's kind of scatterbrained today, but um, the concept that I have is that people own themselves. That is my universal. I apply that to absolutely everything. First, people own themselves. You own yourself. In other words, what I mean is you have the right to think and do with yourself as you wish. I don't even, It's to me, that's an amoral judgment. You own yourself. If you want to tattoo yourself, eat fat, skinny, if you want to die, live, as long as you're an adult, if you want to, you know, cut off your arm if you want i mean i think there's something that's wrong if you want to do that but if you want to do that you own yourself i don't have say over how what you do to yourself because that's your own self right Mm -hmm. where i think that like like psychology where we should help people is when we realize that reasoning is gone Mm -hmm. because then we know you're not actually even doing what you want your reasoning isn't fully there. And that's where I think we can then help and be there for, so it, like, you know, but I still think that once again, axiologically, we slow down and just because they're not at our level doesn't mean they're zero. <laughs> Sometimes I think people treat people with mental illness or mental capacities or low as somehow they're not full persons. Axiologically, you and me know that's still human. That's, that's, that's a person. <laughs> so, I mean, that, so I try to, even when I realize there's, you know, because I, I did, you know, a degree in psychology, and I know that, like, working with criminally ill patients, how much rights should we give them? To me, as much as possible. That's how much. As long as they don't hurt others, you know. Like you said, your core principle and mine go together. Mine is that people own themselves, and I like yours, and I kind of do yours. I just haven't formalized it. I formalized the, for me, the <laughs> one people own themselves, but I, I like yours too, that people, you know, deserve re- a positive regard, which is Carl Rogers um, in psychology says that, you know, counselors should have is unconditional positive regard. And that's kind of okay. what, what you're talking yeah. about. And to yeah. me, it's more than regard. I realized axiologically that, that people have the right to value their own life. And that I see that uh, to value life would be to want life to flourish, not survive, but flourish. So when I yeah, look at yeah. people, I think of that they have the right to flourish. That changes for me how that I, I approach people because I've given them, in other words, like a high worth, like you were talking about in a sense. 
that's what axiology, you know, uh, Hartman also ta is talking about. It's that high worth. I'm doing that. I look at people. I go, they own themselves. And I kind of was doing what you did, but I didn't formalize it. That they have the right to full flourishing. I mean, just because sometimes we, like, they know what I mean by that is to understand. Like when we have, say, an enemy, right? We go, I hope they don't do good in life, you know, or something, you know. Yeah. That's actually axiologically to me not good. Because really, we, we shouldn't we should want them to flourish everybody, and what we should want to do is have them not harming others to you know become better productive people whatever. So and that's I think, like you said you know even like our prison system. Imagine if we applied that axiology people everyone in here, even though they've committed a crime, are still worthwhile humans. How would that not change how we interact with them? Yeah, I agree, and uh, especially when you talk about uh, somebody you don't like. So if you have a principle, all people always deserve positive regard, okay? But what about people you don't like? Yeah. What about people who commit a crime against you? What about somebody who steals the radio out of your car? You know, you're not going to, that's you're going to want to punch them, right, or punish them. Right. And you're not going to treat them with the with positive regard, and so there's that's why I call it an analytical system, because your emotions uh, have their own course. You know, they, if your emotions do their own thing, and so if you have an analytical system, you can analyze where the emotions are going, uh, but you have to distinguish between the the analytical system and the emotions, and and. Emotions. Uh, maybe you can retrain your emotions. Oh, definitely. Uh, to be okay. to be more humanistic, right? But well, uh, yeah, yeah. And, well, you have to distinguish yeah, between us. Well, and that, yeah. that's that's, yeah, that's what that, I've done. I've done. Because I'm I'm I I was I, I, raised I, I, in extreme I, I, abuse under um, um especially my father. Especially I mean, my father. Anyways, was, they were religious, they were and religious, what it, what it made in me was um, mean, conduct disorder as a child. Which is um, basically the, the uh, as an adult that becomes a sociopath, which is what I'm a high functioning sociopath. How I've been able to well, I am. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not joking. I mean like a, a, a medical problem, you know, mental mm -hmm. because of abuse. I mean, I was raised in extreme. I was starved. I was I was abandoned. I was I was um, my tailbone was broken. I was hit by a two by four. I mean, just I had a very brutal childhood. And um, because of that, it made me want to hurt people. I mean, I, I, and, mm. I and I was extremely violent and um, mm. until um, I was 17 and I almost died of alcohol poisoning. I had um, mm. liver failure, alcoholic hepatitis. And anyways, I don't go all of my life. But what that made was just to, just to give the background of why I say that I'm a high functioning sociopath. I'm not like being flippant. I'm I'm it's actually what happened to me. So what it means is I, I didn't understand um, worth, value, anything. It's also oh, why yeah. axiology appeals to me so much. And just like you said, because it can it can it doesn't require emotions. See, that is very mm -hmm. important for someone like me. Because mm -hmm. I don't feel as much emotions connected to ethical things as everybody else. I mean I have mm -hmm. learned to have taught myself. 20 years of counseling and, you know, working on it, I was able to teach myself. But really, the best thing wasn't even the counseling as much as getting axiology. It allowed mm -hmm. me, aha, I can do this and I don't have to have that much empathy. I can mm -hmm. do it because I have standards. Mm -hmm. And I think this is real important because it, to me, not, not, not just someone like me, but I realize for everybody, like you said, anger, anger is an emotion. So if mm -hmm. I'm analytical, like you said, is before the emotions or able to manage the emotions with analytical, I can go, oh, okay. So anger, I'm feeling anger, and I can identify what is its worth axiologically. Well, mm -hmm. all anger would be good for is an alarm system to warn us that something is happening that we should be aware of, that may be imbalance or an error or or causing us some issue. And so... Mm -hmm. That's to me it. Anger's worth should be axiologically just like an alarm system. Well, what happens if an alarm system goes off in my house? I don't leave it on. Axiologically, the value of that raging noise 
is only to me warn me and then I can check the fire and turn the alarm off. I don't live my life with this alarm. Imagine that. But people live their life with anger that way. They haven't valued anger appropriately. They haven't assessed what's the axiological value of anger. To me, it has a very small value. It's just an alarm system. That's it. That's it. We, w- we should be aware. Oh, wow, I feel something that's uh, imbalanced. And I should go look and check. Oh, there's a fire. Or, oh, that was not a fire. That was, some, you know, something else. So turn it off. You don't, same with your car. Same, it's the same thinking. I was trying to give a, a real world, you know, easier, uh, you know, understanding. So if your car alarm goes off, you want that. I mean, in fact, you want it to be loud. So if you're in your sleep and it's, and someone's trying to rob your car, it goes off. But you don't want mm-hmm. that thing going off forever in fact your goal is to immediately turn it off (laughs) so to me that's the same thing how important though axiology is to apply to all of our thinking how important is love how important is compassion how important is kindness like you were talking about that how important is regard for people or respect for people how valuable is respect to me that, it's that slowing down and applying the axiology and then having appropriate, because like you said, once we understand, it's not like we have to do it a thousand times. Once we understand that, like you said, respect for people has a high value, it's easy because now we can just apply that all the time. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, it's so, <laughs> so it's not like, I mean, I don't want axiology to sound like it's even harder than it really is. You know what uh-huh. I'm saying? It does have a real world application. You just sure. have to make standards. It's all we're saying is they have to be justified. That's mm-hmm. all. They have to be justified, which is to me the irrational imperative of all thinking. Your thoughts, mm-hmm. your beliefs should be justified. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And the the point you made about a guy in prison. So that that raises a problem. Huh? When do you when do you justify putting a guy in prison? And, and depriving him of the liberty that everybody else has. And, uh, uh, so you have to, you have to make a judgment. Is a, is a, is a guy who smoked a marijuana joint, uh, is that justification to put somebody in prison? Hope not. Same as, the same as Charles Manson, you know, you, no. Charles Manson kills a bunch of people. He goes to prison and, and the guy who smokes a joint, he goes to prison. Is there is there something there, and that re- that requires some kind of a moral judgment that that honors the dignity and the individuality of another human being, and so you got to think: is this is this human being a threat to us, a threat to society? Is it what's justifiable about putting him in prison? You know, Obama recently pardoned a lot of guys who were in prison for nonviolent drug-related offenses. And, and we're seeing all over the country the, the movement to legalize marijuana, partly because young young guys were going to prison for having pot, you know, and their lives were being ruined and they couldn't get jobs and they were branded ex-con. Yes. And so you can see the, the terrible damage it's doing to a person. And is this damage justifiable? That's the that's the question for society to ask. Putting yeah. Charles Manson in prison and closing the door forever, you know, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's clearly okay. But uh, the guy who smokes pot, you know? Well, 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 first off, the question should be, axiologically, is smoking pot a problem? In the same mm-hmm. thing, like we, you already know, axiologically, is killing people a problem? Yes, so that's why Charles Manson, or people that promote that, it behooves us to to remove them to where we can protect society. But is smoking marijuana wrong? Is it harmful? Is it unbeneficial? It, we, axiologically, since it doesn't kill anybody, it already hasn't violated the first rule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and then since its use doesn't usually preclude people from actually you know, wanting... In other words, I mean is... People get drunk, they a lot of times want to fight. 
Not that many people generally get high and want to go beat people up. In other words, it's, right. <laughs> it's <laughs> so I'm just saying, once again, we can, we can axiologically to me gain a moral fact from that, that it is morally um, not wrong to smoke marijuana, but it is wrong to kill people, which we already know. So things that do kill people, we can start to say maybe they are wrong. But see, then do you have to understand, well, but then alcohol would have to be under that, that it could be wrong because it does kill people. So, but, th but, that, but see, I have before that one that you said about respect, I have that people own themselves. For me, as my first, I start with that because you're, I'm not you. So I mean, I, I already am aware of that fact that I'm not you, and that changes everything. A lot of things, not everything, but a lot of things, because I'm not you. So I, I, I can't be, you know, the one to tell you everything what to do. So it, people can be different, but I, there is, to me, an axiological fact of, like you said, how much can they be different to where it becomes harmful. We need to know okay. that. Sure. So sure. if someone says, well, it's it's wrong that Damien has a red beard. Is it? Why is it wrong? So you're going to have to give me, once again, justification. Why? Yeah. Why is it wrong? What about it? I, I love, I love this, this one because it helps people understand the concepts. We appeal to authority too much because we learn this from religion and gods. As, as atheists, yeah. we should, and I'm a rationalist, by the way, not a skeptic. I, I don't mm. doubt things. I start with reason. You push me hard enough, I'm going to keep reasoning. That's what mm. I do. And if I do ever doubt something, it's because I felt it was reasonable. Mm. <laughs> but anyways, I'm just saying. So when the concept uh, um, uh, of gods and stuff makes us want to generalize because they teach us this, but it, it's not really appropriate to do that. There really is a lot of layers of value. That's what I really want people to understand. It's not just looking at the world and seeing one, one, one. No, it's like, one has 10,000, one has three, one has eight. I mean, it's not, it is, it, and it, but there's different things that come off of it because you have the intrinsic worth of the person, you have, you know, their extrinsic or what they're doing, you have their systemic, how it affects. So there's multiple layers of things always. So, it, but we can, like you said, I think is the most important thing. And now I've gotten from th talking with you is making these very firm standards. I think this is something I need to do. I haven't really done. But now talking to you, I realize I have all this concept, but I haven't like like formalized enough standards because I agree. Really, once you get standards, that helps everybody, including me, to then navigate our stuff. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So if everybody is starting from the same position, then all the little nuanced problems that, that arise you have principles that you can use to clarify the problem, and then you can make your judgments based on a clarified problem and not a not a big mix of emotions and, and confused thoughts and, and things like that. I think it's good. Analyze the problem and make it clear, and it gives you the opportunity to use your own judgment. Yeah, I think it's really good. I also wanted to bring up with you, um, and I'm going to explain it, the... Um, mm -hmm. What is the uh, uh, you know your opinion about um, axiology or morality um, in relation to G. E. Moore's uh, naturalistic fallacy? And for those that don't know, uh, Moore's uh, contended that uh, goodness cannot be analyzed in terms of any other property, which I think is bizarre. My first uh, before you respond, I just want to say my first thought when I heard that statement. How does he know this? And is this a believed objective truth? And how does he know it is? Mm. In other words, I'll read again what he said, because that already bothered me. I didn't even get to read the whole thing, but just, it really bothered me what he said. Mm. <laughs> he says, so I'll say it again. He, he contends that goodness cannot be analyzed in terms of any other property. How does he know that? And then morals, and then his argument um, for the uh, indefensibility of good. He thinks we can't defend the term good in a sense. And thus, um, it is uh, fallacious and a naturalistic fallacy to try to attribute that to good. 
It is often called an open question argument. It is presented in, it was presented in 13 principles, um, or it's called Principle Ethica. It's like a, a, article, a research thing, journal or something. And the argument uh, hinges that um, the nature or state status of, of things such as anything uh, that is pleasant is also good. And the possibility of asking questions such as, is it good that um, X is pleasant? According to Moore, these questions are open and these statements are significant. <coughs> and they will um, remain so no matter what is uh, substituted for the word pleasure. Moore concludes, this from any other analysis of value is bound to fail. How does he know this? In other words, if value could be analyzed, then such questions and statements would be trivial and obvious. Since they are anything but trivial or obvious to more, their value cannot be um, in, indefensible. In other words, you can't defend it, that, that we have value of what goodness is. So real quick, before you answer, before, before I say anything, I just want to say that there's critiques of this not just us, so especially uh, moral realists, but anyways, um, critiques of morals argument sometimes contain appealing to the uh, generalized puzzle concerning the analysis, i.e. the paradox of his analysis itself. He's creating a paradox by doing it. Rather, he has not really revealed anything special about what is value or goodness or its properties or lack of properties, the argument clearly uh, depends on the assumption that if good were defendable, that it would be analytically true. See, so he's actually helped us, <laughs> to me, because he's saying that if this, if you, we can show this, then he'll agree that we have proved it true. So all we have to do is then show it. Which I think we do with axiology. I think that he doesn't understand what he's talking about. Because he's making these generalized statements and not thinking that, yeah, but it's a layered. And then from that understanding of all these axiological layers and then assessments of the different things, you know, value by doing that, then we can do stuff. But anyways, so that that's just what the the, uh, the people are kind of saying. So what what's your your take on that? So I'll read it again just to clarify what, what you're responding to, not the whole thing. So it's his naturalistic right. fallacy, and we'll start with his first thing for you. So Moore says that he contends that goodness cannot be analyzed in terms of any other property. What's your response? Okay, so the everything that I've been talking about, about the axiology, is based on uh, the writings of a guy named Robert S. Hartman. And he wrote a book called The Structure of Value. And the structure of value is what I've been saying. The people are the most important thing. And then you have, uh, uh, that means people are more important than things and people are more important than ideas. So uh, that's, that's one thing he said. The other thing he did was he studied G.E. Moore. Mm. And and he was he went crazy trying to figure out what's the problem with uh, with what Moore is saying. So Moore said that you can't find the goodness of a thing in its properties. Mm. Like for example, you take a tree and a tree's got leaves and a tree's got bark and a, and uh, it's got roots. Yeah. So where's the goodness? And and so Hartman finally figured out. Uh, the goodness is is in the concept. It's it's got uh, three parts. Okay, it's in the concept, in the thing, and in the way the thing fulfills the concept. Mm. So, a tree is is a good tree not because it's 
of its bark or its leaves, but because it has the properties of a tree as, as people define it in their heads. So Hartman, Hartman built on the naturalistic fallacy and developed his, his theory of goodness, which is the fulfillment of concepts. You can measure how good a thing is. Like you talked about a cup earlier. Yeah. And, and if the cup holds coffee and, and, uh, and you can drink out of it, then it's a good cup. I agree. Because that, that fulfills our concept of a cup. And, and for more, more would say, how can you say it's a good cup? It's got a handle. It's got a dip in the, made out of plastic. And so what? What is that? How does that make it good? And what makes it good is not any of the properties, mm. but how the properties fulfill your concept of a cup. And so that was the way that uh, Hartman solved the problems that Moore was raising. And the pleasure, the pleasure thing, you can't equate pleasure with goodness. Well, that was just uh, uh, <clears throat> hedonism and the problem of my pleasure and your pleasure might be different. And so that's that's the the relativity of pleasure. You know, that's a separate problem from what is goodness. But but right. But, and, and on the even on that that point right there about pleasure, I don't think that it's actually up in the air of what's pleasurable. <clears throat> Only thing we have is the details is different. In other words, no one thinks that chopping off someone's head is a pleasurable act to the person having it done. Unless they actually wanted death. But then it wouldn't have still been pleasurable. It's just that they wanted death even though the cutting would have been very painful in a sense. So it had the pleasure principle in a sense didn't change. So I, I think of it, it's easier axiologically to make judgments on things as a group of ideas. I think so we can say that it's, it's, it's not pleasurable to be burnt alive, right? We can say this. I mean, this is not even a, it's a one again. <laughs> it's not like I'm saying, you know, stuff. So I can, we can all say objective truth in a sense for humans or for sensation beings, being burnt alive is not pleasurable. So that means we can, it, but this is what reminds me, it's easier to say what's not pornography than it is to say what's art. Because in a sense, what's art? Every time we add a line, a curve, a, a, we're adding art. Man, humans like love to, to put art everywhere. I mean, we put curves on on buildings and things just because we love art. <laughs> but do we love art, as you were saying again, more than human beings? Here's this thing that we do all the time, art everywhere. But is art more than human beings? Well, the problem is some people say yes. People have killed for like a, a picture of art. They've made it more than human beings. I mean, it's it's so it's it's extremely the problem to me. I always see it as an axiological problem before a morality problem. It's an axiological problem because if we both understood that, say, burning people alive was extremely terrible and hurtful to human beings, and like you said, if we axiologically know that because I'm an, a human being, I wouldn't, you know, in a sense, think that it's okay to burn me. You know, and I don't think it's okay to burn other people because we all know objectively that that causes pain and it's going to be terrible. <laughs> it's not that hard to say that it's not pleasure and we shouldn't do it to others, to me. And we're not, we're not, it's not subjective that we all know fucking pain hurts. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a subjective thing. The, 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 the subjective thing is where is it pain that hurts in the level of where we don't want it? in pain in a sense that we like. In other words, we like scary movies. Well, being terrified has never been something we consider to be valuable. But yet people go to these movies because it terrifies them. So they are obviously having some value in terror. So, so when I say terror has no value, I've actually not looked at humans, have I? Because... That's something we would say, but that is not an actual fact. 
So if I said it's a moral fact that people don't like to be terrified, so we should never terrify people, actually, I've not said a moral fact. Yeah. And I can say that because it's not, because it doesn't match reality. It's not corresponding to reality or the corresponding to the concept of, in a sense, human human dignity or whatever. Humans owning themselves. They, I couldn't do it because of all these other uh, things that, that show me where to place the value, where to place the moral weight, where to place this moral reasoning. Moral reasoning is the ability of navigating these moral weights, these axiological values to me. Yeah, and another thing with, like with pain, uh, for, for an athlete training, uh, the, the pain is a sign of progress in yeah. the development of his or her muscles, right? right. Yeah. And so... In some cases, pain is good. No pain, no gain. Right, exactly. Even, even when you're dieting, you know, I'm, I mean, I can tell you from experience. Oh. And, and it's a struggle not to uh, not to eat something to to ease that pain. Uh, but uh, there's a there's the extreme form of that would be like the uh, the religious people who whip themselves, you know, because of their guilt. Right. And they think. Uh, this this is really painful, and they're tearing up their skin, and they're bleeding, and they're thinking, God loves me because I'm I'm torturing myself, I'm punishing myself, or castigating myself, and so there is an element there where pain can be good, and pain can be even self-inflicted pain can be good, and self-inflicted pain can be crazy, and and you really have to look at the concepts involved. The, the motivation of the person uh, who's who's causing themselves pain. Yeah, I think you bring up some uh, uh, things. It sounds like a lot like common sense to I think both of us in a sense. Uh, People hear that and go, oh, "How come that's not just common sense standard for morality?" Uh, and then I I would ask you, so why would you say that we couldn't just have a common sense in a sense? I, you know, I'm I'm being it's a colloquial term. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not trying to define. I'm just using it colloquially. Common sense, you know, standard for morality. And like, um, what I mean is, like you said, principles. But common sense would mean that almost that we're constantly at, to lead that. I mean, I'm reading from the, the what the Christian, you know, was termed. Do we have common sense, you know, standard for morality? I'm just thinking. I think they mean intuitive, right? Because they're because common sense to me would mean not like what you're doing, or like even me having a standard of saying that uh, people own themselves. I think it means no principles. You just constantly, intuitively, whatever happens, you just kind of react. Why would that be a bad system? Well, common sense is uh, largely social conditioning. So that it's common sense in Saudi Arabia for women to to not to drive. It's common sense. Oh, you know? It's yeah, common yeah. sense that they have to wear a burqa, they have to have a man with them when they're on the street. And if you catch somebody shoplifting, it's just common sense. You cut off their hand. <laughs> so well, common sense is, uh, you know, it's a culturally different thing. Yeah. And that's why you need to have analysis and you need to have moral or principles of value yes. so you can analyze this. Is it, is it really, uh, are the values in the correct proportion there when you say, Women have to wear burkas and can't drive, or you cut off a guy's hand for stealing, shoplifting something. Is are those values in proportion? They're not a proportion. If you think, you know, all people always deserve positive regard, and 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 then you have to justify why you disregard their the, a person, why you have a negative situation for people, and so there isn't a justification for it the treatment of women or cutting off a guy's hand because he stole something. Uh, uh, so common sense has to be analyzed uh, according to axiological principles. And and then if it passes muster, you can say, okay, that's okay. But common sense without some other standard, some, some analytical standard, doesn't make sense. Okay, the other thing would be, is this a fixed or an evolving standard? In other words, like, does would it change over time or place? Or do you feel that an axiological standard is, in a sense, 
is more fixed. Well, uh, by fixed, I, I would say you have a commitment and you don't change your commitment. Also, uh, human beings are a biological organism. So as long as, as long as the biological organism is there, then, uh, man is the supreme being for man or humans is the supreme being for humans. There was a time when there wasn't a biological organism. And maybe in the future there'll be a time when there's no biological organism. But for that period in between where you've got the biological organism, then the standard, uh, everybody deserves respect, that standard would hold. Hmm. So are you saying that, on Yeah, I understand. So are you, are you saying are, that um, it's self-determined? I'm, I'm just reading the, 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 the Christian's questions. So is it yeah. self-determined? And why not um, just have a self-determined standard of, of all morality? Did you say self-determined? Self-determined. That's what they say. If if you say morals are self, let's read it. Are, if you say morals are self-determined, then uh, are they true for everyone or just you? Well, um, I I think I would have to say uh, that if I believe. In my principle, if I'm really committed to my principle, then I then I say it's universal. And so and so uh, for me, uh, all people deserve positive regard and, and the disregard, any kind of a disregard that requires justification. Uh, so for me, that's true for everybody. <laughs> So so that, so, that so is that, is that, so hold on though but is that I agree with you this is like, but to me then you've just stated a moral fact What's that You just did that, that universally you believe that universally all people should do the the um uh, everyone deserves um respect Yeah I I have no problem yeah, with it I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you I'm a moral realist to an extent yeah. I mean, to a reasonable extent, everything that I do has to be past the mustard of justification. Everything has to be backed up scientifically or, or reasoned out. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with, so I don't want anyone to think I agree with all moral, the, uh, you know, realists. Uh, no. Yep. <laughs> but in general, some of the things they say, I agree. I agree there are such things as moral facts. I don't think that all moral things that we think are moral facts. No. Some are just moral opinions, <laughs> but I do think that even opinions, there's a difference. Axiologically, I do not generalize. Axiologically, we know that all opinions are not equal. If your opinion is that people should be treated good, and let's just say it has no uh, ontological truth or epistemological truth, it's just purely your opinion. Let's assume that that's true for just for the sake of, of argument. And then we have Charles Manson, who it's also his opinion, because there's no ontological facts in the world at all. His opinion is everyone should be tortured. These are two opinions. Can we not say that one is axiologically more uh, preferable than the other? I don't see how anyone couldn't. And so because of that, I, I that in a sense almost is a moral fact that there's the reason why it's a moral fact is not because there's something we find in the world. It's because we're limited in the properties that we're talking about. We're talking about humans. Humans are limited to an emotional state where we never are not emotional. It's a, it's a neurological fact. Our brains are emotional machines that have this thinking strategy called reason that other lower form of you know, intellectual beings don't have. And that reason allows us to be aware of morality. In a sense, that gives us beyond intuition to me. Because intuition just gives us the, the desire for, in a sense, gives the, the weight to our axiological value, our desire does. You know, say, our desire, I feel, you know, I want to care. That, that adds to it. But it's not the thing itself. So the, the people, um, you know, they they want to have um, universal things, but a lot of times they're applying uh, really just instinct. 
but instinct isn't always correct because once again, we understand that your instinct to do stuff, like you talk about hedonism, let's just say that you want to be celibate and I like to have tons of sex. Is there a axiological judgment? To me, no, but people want to be able to. So sometimes we don't know when to apply things and when not to apply. Yeah. Like, you know, so if you like eating pizza with, with, you know, pepperoni and I like eating it with mushrooms, to me, that's not even a moral question. To even ask like it is a moral question is is forgetting unless you want to talk about the toppings. But once again, then you you've you've not made the main um, problem. You're focusing in on the details, which I think we should. Is pepperoni meat? Is meat killing? Mm-hmm. Some people think it is. So, but that that to me it was just weird to me about about that is they've axiologically done something wrong. Like you said, if I'm a tiger. And I kill people. Am I doing something immoral? And you would, and a person would say no, because that that, be, that animal doesn't understand larger concepts of morality or human worth or worth. It's it's just basically to me operating on a kinship morality, like bonded to me. That's who matters, and almost everything else is is, is not valuable or is open to being disvalued at least. Maybe they don't inherently look around and devalue everything, but everything in a sense is open to being disvalued. I mean, lions will kill other um, babies that are not theirs. They have no value even for, you know, lion life. It's just familial life. But so like, but if we were, you and me were lions, would that be an ethical? No, under that system. So, but intuition is not enough to run morality to me. <laughs> because intuition would say, like the lion, only caring about its family, the, the killing anything else, fine. Yeah, but is it fine? <laughs> just can, can, in other words, could they just kill at will? Could they just every day just kill, not even for food, just kill? You know, with that, you start to understand that, that there's everything has this um, balance in its environment. What is it doing? Can we, like I always tell people, to me, I don't put axiology in uh, trees, in a sense, that much value. Like if I said, what's the difference between killing uh, um, Bill and killing a tree? Well, there's a bunch of things. First off, we have Bill's worth, but the tree feels no pain. Let's say, okay, so if the tree feels no pain, is there any moral responsibility for trees? Well, I think there's a moral responsibility for our environment. Those trees also do something like produce oxygen. I also think that in a sense... All things, in a sense, own themselves. I don't. I try to be aware of not just, you know, acting as if I can do anything I want. You know, it's that thinking difference. It doesn't mean that a tree is as much as you. No, that'd be insane. But to say a tree has zero value, of course that's insane. Of course that it shades people. It helps other other you know animals and things and environment and just in general. Just think. Is there any moral problem? I've thought about this before, and I, and I think there is. Is there any moral problem of, say, eliminating all oak trees? I mean, all of them. Not all trees. There's still oxygen. There's still shade. The animals can still do something. Is there wrong, something morally wrong with intentionally, like, taking out one set of tree? It, and I think it's an awareness that, that we have to behave in a more... Um, uh, non, um, I don't know, like aggressive manner to world, the, the world in general. Like you said about respect, respect is more than just understanding value. Respect is an honoring of the dignity and the value. Mm-hmm. It's a different. It's it's not even just saying because see you didn't just say that I look at the world and say humans have value. You mm-hmm. made the further step from that. Which I'm fine with. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to help people understand because I know mm-hmm. <laughs> if they're not axiologists and they hear all this, it can be confusing. You've taken the further step and you've said that not only do they have the value, is it contained in the property of human? That you've already said how to behave. That that thing should be respected. Mm-hmm. So it's already attaching not just its value, but then the duty of what to do with it. In other words, it's all like, like virtue ethics. Virtue mm-hmm. ethics says. That, you know, you should do this because it's virtuous. Like, respect is a virtuous act. You're giving respect. We say someone's being respectful. We're honoring that they've done something unusual in a sense. 
So I'm not, that I don't think is unusual. We're just axiologically, we, we've humans, or at least English language, respect usually means like it's some kind of honor or it's given something. So you say that all, I think I, cause I don't, I don't, didn't write, I'm not reading what you wrote down or something, but, um, you said all humans, I believe, all humans deserve respect. Is that what something you said or all, you say it again? All, all persons, all persons always deserve Positive regard. Okay. All, all persons always deserve positive regard. So there's multiple things in that. You have all, so that's universal. So that, 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 that means that, that to me, when you, when you agree to presuppositions, you're then limited to what that means. Mm -hmm. So when you say all, you're saying universal, but that means that you, agree that there's a necessity for universal ethics automatically you, you in fact to me you can't even get outside of it because that at least you'd have to agree there's one universal ethic but again that would be a moral fact one yeah. universal moral fact and I, like i said i'm fine with that as long as we're, we know what we're talking about <laughs> Like you said, not fact is in scientific found in the ground. Oh, look at there's there's caring for people. Oh, there's respect that found it. There's a whole you know we can mine respect out of the ground. No, so that that would be a total error. What we're talking about is logical facts, like reasoned facts. That's what I would say. When you know when I use moral facts, I mean that it, it's justifiable, it's warranted, it's um it's given its substance, it's given its uh, worth. It's rich with the qualities that, uh, you know, uh, emulate what, what that's trying to say. When it does that, then to me, I'm okay with that word fact. But I, but I agree with you. I'm talking about fact as in, like it's a fact that something's a logical fallacy, right? But that's a logical fact. There's no logical fallacies in the world. Yeah. Humans, in fact, if I asked you, well, how do we know that that's objectively true? That it's a logical fallacy, something, anything. See, now I, you, you would have to give a justification for logic itself. <laughs> and to me, I always I laugh when people ask questions like that because, in a sense, that's what you're doing when you ask that question. You've just done logic, <laughs> you've just analyzed what we were talking about. Now you're telling me it's not true and you're using the tool that. Is the tool you're trying to debunk? <laughs> you're using logic and asking me how do I justify logic, and that's a logical question. It's yeah. just they don't even get that. Like, like, <laughs> the contradiction of what you just said to me as a rationalist is hilarious. You're going, I don't believe in reason, and it's not reasonable that you believe in reason. They're like, didn't you just use reason? To do what you, like, you, do you not really understand what you're talking about? But I think that's, it's true in a sense, axiologically. A lot of people are just not aware. And when you ask them, they like, value things, they've never even thought about it. But yet, if you ask them, are you a moral person? Well, of course I am. Like, I, I love, like, I ask, ask people, you know, ask, people ask me, like, what's, what's good? And I go, good to me, and it's a general thing, is do no harm and do help. That is good. That things that have those qualities that don't do harm and that have qualities of help, those are good. I mean, it's a, it's a simple thing in general. Like you said, a rule. That's just my general rule. I, I, I don't, if, if I don't analyze it deeply, if I just think a general rule, I apply that. That if I, if I think something is good or if so you say something is good, it's got to fit those qualities. It's not harmful, like you said about. You know, people deserve respect. And it's helpful, which is the respect. It's the behavior, the action. So one is the not doing an action. The other part is the doing an action. That's good. Because to me, good is not just not doing wrong. In other words, good is not just an absence of bad. <laughs> it is the quality of the doing something that is that is good. You know, that is helpful, that is beneficial, that is valuable, that is worth. That, that adds substance, that adds well-being, that adds flourishing. These are the things to me that are good. And so it's easy to me, as opposed to things that diminish that and remove that. And <laughs> it, it immediately, to me, it helps process. Because once you understand, like, like Hartman did, once you understand how to do good, 
you realize that actually is applicable to like a lot of things mm-hmm. in life. It's not it's some limited theoretical concept on some ivory tower that a philosopher came up with, you know, so that it makes other philosophers, you know, feel good about themselves. No, it, to me, really, I feel sad that most people are not utilizing axiology, the wonderful benefit it has. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the one of the problems that you're raising is uh, is uh, enforcement because uh, people have different ideas about uh, what's good or what's proper or how to act, and so if you're going to have an or if you're going to have order in a society, any kind of basic order, you're going to have to enforce some principles and uh, and exclude other principles so uh, for example a theocracy enforces everybody to stop and pray five times a day or off with your head right or they'll stone you or something like that and so there's there's certain values that some people like and in our country not yet anyway we're not we're not enforcing those kind of values, so some some decision has to be made, and so what I do is um, I just I just articulate analytical tools so that you can analyze the situation, and so I'm not saying you have to respect everybody or you're going to jail. I'm saying uh, all people deserve respect, and now let's start with that as an analytical point. Does this activity show respect for people? And if it doesn't, is that disrespect justifiable mm-hmm. by, for practical reasons? Because practical reasons, uh, can override the respect, right? So right, definitely. the guy you put in jail, I mean, it's, it's, you, you disrespect the guy in a sense because you limit his freedom, but as a practical matter, He's uh, he's an active sociopath, right? And and yeah, and not high functioning. <laughs> yeah, he's not he's not done twenty years of counseling and worked on himself like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After yeah. twenty years, if he if he gets okay, then you can let him out. Right. Yeah. And and, but, and, 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 a, and a real quick about that. So I still have the operating system that's not great at at feeling empathy for things, but don't confuse that that means that you have to harm people. Even no. if I felt no empathy, I could still do ethics with axiology is what I'm trying to say to people. Axiology does not require that you um, add emotion to it. Although I do think motions should be added at some point for ethics because that helps us to, to navigate care. Or even axiologically, we could assess how much emotions could be involved. But the axiology itself, I agree, should not be emotional. It should be analytical. But the good yep. thing is, yeah, but that's all I think. I think more uh-huh. analytical than I think emotional because I am a high-functioning sociopath. I don't operate on high emotion. Now, I, in other words, I feel almost no stress almost most of the time. In fact, that they take my blood pressure. I'm real heavy. I'm like, you know, overweight, but yet my, my blood pressure is really low. They're like amazed. And I'm like, well, I'm unstressed. I'm like, How do you do that? And I have tons of problems in my life. And I'm still, well, it's not like I'm some gift. It, it's really because I don't operate like everybody else. I don't operate with this emotional reaction it's so high. Like the volume on, in other words, to me, everyone's volume is up real high. Everything is really reactive. Where mine's, in a sense, really low. We're almost nothing. But when I do react, it's inappropriate. That's the sociopath. So I have to watch how I react. But this really has helped me actually clarify morality because where you may think, oh, I just am a good person. Or I got to think, okay, I'm really not a good person. How do I become a good person? What is a good person? How? Because well, because I wanted to, I I wanted to be better. I knew like I I didn't I didn't even know what better meant at the time when I started counseling. I just wanted to stop hurting people. That's all. I just if I can just stop hurting people, I would be happy. Well, now I, I feel like I'm happy in my life because I've done the exact opposite. I am actually someone 
who helps people. I'm someone who helps, not just helps people like as in, I, and I've done, I've gone to orphanages and helped people in Mexico. I've helped homeless. I've done I've activism stuff for women, for, for trans. Yeah. The point though is that what's changed is not the helping. I've actually, like you said, become a moral leader in, 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 or trying to in the atheist movement. And so, because I know it is so important, and I want people to understand, even when you're angry, and I have, and all I, before, my method, you know, biologically and environment of abuse made me want to do violence. I, I, you do something wrong, like you said, punch in the face. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, got, I got suspended in seventh grade 23 times for fighting on just the bus alone. I never made oh. it even to school. <laughs> I mean, I just... But how did I change? Really, like I said, the most grounding and most, that makes me feel so good inside is axiology, because, like you said, it's analytics. So I don't have to be empathetic to understand. I just go, okay, people are worth. I don't have to understand. It doesn't have to feel worth it to me. But then again, I don't have to value pizza, or 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 say you know liverwurst. I don't have to value it to know you do. You see, I realize that that's why the that how I feel. The golden rule ethic. Well, if I ran my morality how I feel, you guys would be worth about plastic. You know, you you wouldn't have that. I mean, it would be. That's I as a kid, I told my mom. I, I didn't even know what it was. I mean, later I learned. You know, I've got tons of counseling, but I mean, I, I told her. I said, I everyone seems happy. I don't understand even why you're happy. Why you're happy to eat, but why? You're just shoving the stuff in. I don't even – if you slow – I mean, for how I see it, everything is not emotional in a sense. I see you putting – just shoving food in your mouth and it being all the messy and and then you having to go to the bathroom and, and then the smells and, the, and just analyzing and then how like people like get so happy to do things. And, like do what? You all want to hang out as a family and talk to these people you can't stand. You talk to behind their back. Even when they're there, you fake laugh. You act interested. You, you, or you boast about yourself in unrealistic ways, <laughs> you know, and then you make food that really isn't good. You always feel extremely obligated to tell everybody, no matter how bad the food, even if it was burnt, you know, with a blowtorch, that somehow it was still okay and appreciate the meal when maybe you don't. I mean, I just, I'm looking at this, this world felt like just lies. That's all people did. Walked around in their life and just lied, 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 lied. lied. And then they're calling me the bad person because I'm saying I don't care. I'm like, well, you guys don't care. You're just lying. Mm -hmm. You guys don't care either. I'm just the only one that's being the truth. Well, I learned later that's not totally accurate. <laughs> Once again, that's a sociopath looking at the world going, why should I care? You guys say I should care. I'm looking around. You guys are liars. You don't care. <laughs> you guys go, I want to help people when I'm rich. Yeah, but you don't help people now. And how many people you know, they are rich don't help people either, you know? So, go ahead. You know, what you're, what you're saying now is uh, I, think, I think you're raising a really important distinction here. And, and uh, in Hartman's axiology, he, he makes this distinction, the distinction between social ethics mm. and individual ethics. Right. I, I think you called it earlier, you said morals are personal yes. and ethics are social. Correct. That's how I break it down, yeah. And I hear that in what you're saying now, uh, on the standard of uh, by by holding people to the standard of authenticity. Yes, that, that's what I hear you saying. You know, like you're saying, somebody says they like something, well, they're lying. They don't like it. And yes. and the standard there is inauthenticity. Yes, they're not being the authentic person. They're they're being a phony or something like that. Right. And that's a that's a a separate problem from Social ethics, you know, yes. uh, everybody's social ethics, you know, if you work for a guy and, and, and he says he's going to pay you, he's got to pay you. Right. But but personal authenticity is a whole nother problem. And so I hear you talking about it. And I see that in your writings, too. Yeah. That uh, that you really have a, a big concern with with personal authenticity. Yes, I do. And and, tr and defining what that is and seeing that in people. And I think that's a that's an area that needs a lot more clarification, you know, 
but uh, yeah, but I think that you're uh, you're good on that. You you you're good in that area. Well, I thank you for the compliment. And and like I said though, I, I realized that I had an error that I was never applying. And there was I was looking at the world like you said analytical. I was looking at the world analytical, but the problem is. I was assuming that that means it's only analytical, but that's not true. That's an abstraction. Our reasoning, in a sense, is an abstraction to the human that we actually are. And I was, yeah. as you said, I was, as a sociopath, was confused. You guys don't do that. And, if, and probably the concept of me breaking it down like this probably seems bizarre to a lot of people. But to a sociopath, it's not because you guys inherently look at people and go, oh, they're valuable. And we look at it and we go, no, they're not. What what justify it? Why is that? I don't feel any value. In other words, you intrinsically feel more value for others than I feel. I now intentionally make it a, a, a and have for 20 years or actually um, you know, 25, six years. I don't know. But anyways, a long time. I, I have deliberately wanted to structure how to be a good person. You no, know, regardless of who you are, and like even like me, high function just soap at. I don't care. I don't care what your inclinations are. That can't be how you do morality. My inclinations would be to disrespect everybody that no one deserves. In fact, I would say no one deserves respect because respect is an earned thing. No one has operated with me. How could I then universally know anyone's operating in the world? And thus, that is a fallacy. But in a sense, it's not. You understand? Because I'm saying I'm missing. The quality of the value of humans. Mm. I'm well, not now, but I mean, back then, I I, yeah, I I was looking at the world and going, it doesn't have any value. I don't. Your guys are like making shit up. Then how you act, you certainly don't act like it's even valuable. Hey, you want me to care? But now I realize, oh. well, like you said, people have a standard of, of morality like you do and which i think is good you know that um all people deserve um positive regard positive regard sorry <laughs> positive regard I just forgot so all, all people deserve positive regard because of that 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 is that is a good standard because see i like i said the problem is that's assuming this biology that humans are different that is doing a whole bunch of stuff i agree with it now but I'm saying it's looking at all these axiological qualities without realizing it. It has all these presuppositions. It's the, it's it's saying humans have worth. And it's obviously biologically assumed humans for some properties different than animals in a sense. Because how could you classify yeah. them? You know, it, it starts doing a whole bunch of things. And then because of that, 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 that humans obviously are attached to something the animals are not, right? Because... No other animal we're going to send to jail for a moral problem. So we're only holding morality to other humans. So we're already presuming that. I mean, that's a presupposition that we've pre-assumed this fact. You do. Everybody does. But like I said, what, what a sociopath goes, why? No. Wrong. You've made this up. You've made up some fantasy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what, uh -huh. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, somebody, it's, it's, you've made up a fantasy. This, like you said uh -huh. about superheroes, it's like you've made up this book and you've said that morals is a thing, which I don't see mm. any of it. I see you guys acting not moral, that even to your own standards, and yet you want to hold me to it, you know. But anyway, so but I, I really realized that that itself is the fallacy because mm. I assumed you can get outside of morality. You can't. Because we're moral reasoning, because all morality to me is, and since ethics particularly, I'm going to talk about, forget morals, because I feel morals a personal issue. I'm talking about how we behave with others. So our ethics, so our social thing, our ethics with others, to me, that is the thing that, that really matters about morality. In other words, in a sense, I don't really care what your values are. I only care how you behave. I don't care what your morals are, how you want to live your life. You want to whip yourself in the back if you want to. You know, personally, you know, whatever. But I do care how you behave with their people. Because, see, this arena is what really matters. So all the other things about morality are all that important. But it's really where the rubber meets the road. How we behave with other people is what I really think we talk about when we say morality. You know, it's, it's the behavior. So because it's a behavior, it produces things from that behavior. I don't, and I feel like we've given, once again, to me, 
I feel like, and even now, I feel like we've given morality this like metaphysical status it doesn't deserve. It is mm -hmm. a behavior just like all other behaviors. Mm -hmm. To me, in a sense. I mean, we don't need to give it this weight that it doesn't have. What I mean, we certainly say that, say, going to work or pr making your own means of production or something. If you if you can say that, you're saying that a person has the right to that. You're saying a person has this can can produce this thing called property in a sense, have relations to it or control over it. Or those are a whole bunch of things that this person has a right. We're 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 assuming. Like I said, I don't want to get into all that why, but but we don't realize when we say things. I know you probably do more than other people. But I'm saying a lot of people we we just say things. We don't realize it has all these like axiological presuppositions attached to it. Like if I say, no. humans have rights. Well, I've already assumed that there's a thing called humans. I would, I would assume mm -hmm. that it's, a, it's a biologically different than animals or right. cars. I've already assumed this. I mean, obviously, about that statement, right? Of humans. So I've already assumed, there's a whole bunch of presuppositions. There's a presuppositions that, um, that this behavior can be talked about and transmitted to others. I just told you humans have value. Why did I say it out loud? I hope that you would listen, right? So I'm assuming that there's another person in the world, uh, external of myself, and that they that words matter to them, and that concepts, as you said, concepts, concepts matter and have value, because I just gave you a concept of human, I just gave you a concept of rights, and then I told you that humans have a connection to this thing called rights. Then I assume that, that, that human rights is something that I have to, uh, or anybody should feel obligated um, to offer, because if I say humans deserve rights, all you would have to do if you didn't think that is why. That's all you'd have to say. You wouldn't even have to make some strong moral argument. You could just go, why, in a sense. But see, as you and I both know, that would be a very simple question asked, but the answer would have to be monumental. Otherwise, what we really should do when someone asks a simple question, to me, I figured it out now, is we give them a simple answer. So when they say, well, why? You say, because that's the way humans are. See, I gave them a simple answer. They'll say, well, that's not good enough. Well, either was your question. Give me a better yeah. question, and maybe you'll get a better answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, my motto in general is, is, is the, the best defense is an attack. <laughs> so... I, I and and I and I do what's uh, my style. I call it the. Uh, it's, it's basically it's uh, scientific philosophy, or what I call it the hammer of truth, because it basically crushes error and it builds accuracy. And I think that in a sense, w when we say we have certainty, we never have a hundred percent. In a sense, that statement is stupid about percentages. But to me, we have levels of accuracy. That's when I say something builds certainty for me. The level of accuracy has become to a level that I feel has an epistemic worth, that it's epistemic value, that it's axiological, you know, um, properties have fulfilled, like you said, fulfilled something. It does something. So the, when, it, when it comes to the, uh, applying it, though, is where to me the it really is the problem. So that's what they do. They're asking us, give the how we apply it. You know what I'm saying? They're not asking if we have it. They want this long justification, but yet they, they want to ask the why, just a little simple question. They're trying to ask this. So, but why do we feel that we need to give this universal answer to every small little question? I realize that's, I'm like, why? So I just give, I'm trying to like, Think about the value, because I realize axiologically I have to value my own time, <laughs> and then I realize that other people do. So the be the better I can make axiology more accessible, in the sense easier to use but still, you know, viable to the general public, then I've actually done something of value. I gave <laughs> axiology yeah. to people, which yeah, I don't know sure. what what could be more valuable than that. <laughs> yeah, if if you can if you can use it. Yeah, if you can use it. You give it to them, well, they <laughs> use it and appreciate it. Well, but you know what? I've done something. No one even knew it existed. <laughs> so, yeah. not no one, but I mean, the general public, a lot of people, I mean, I now have at least um, 200,000 people that know about axiology. I'm not saying that oh, 
I've done. Yeah. I'm not saying that that's you know the end of the world. I'm not done. I've just begun mm-hmm. in the atheist community. I'm 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 going to push even harder. <laughs> so, but and and I constantly tell people I'm an axiological atheist. I constantly tell them what axiology is. I've even said several times have told people about you, about progressive logic, about uh, your mm-hmm. your um uh, posts uh, that you've made on uh, academic uh, thing because it's it's oh. important. So, uh, if, if if you could do anything you want, what let's end this almost. But so, if you could do anything that you want, what in the atheist community, what would you like to offer? What do you or what do you think that you could offer that maybe you haven't thought about offering? But if I said, you know, what could you offer? What what, what would you like to see? What what you know? Well, uh, what bothers me in our society is is there's moral chaos, and and uh, there's very little agreement about you know what's valuable, what the what the order of values is, uh, and we have and the the church. It's an opportunity for the church to move in and say we've got the morality, <laughs> and move into political institutions, and to say you know our morality justifies. Uh, Shutting down Planned Parenthood, or or our morality justifies putting pot smokers in prison, and and uh, atheists are almost defenseless because we don't have an organized moral system to put out there and say, look, your system is bullshit, and look at our system, right. which is better. You know, our system right. is based on. Humans and, and making life better for humans, improving humans. That's why I call the book Progressive Logic. I, I go into the history of the progressive movement mm. in the United States and they're, and they're acting on those values, but they didn't have the principles. So All I right. stated the principles and say, look, these are the principles they acted on. And so if I had, you know, if I was God, I would, I would organize atheists and, 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 and teach them these moral principles and say, show these principles to people like you're doing, you know. Yeah. Show these principles to people and, and people will learn, hey, atheism has a moral system. Yes. We can be free of God and know how to act right. and have an idea of what's morally correct. But we don't have the, we're free of God, but we don't have the, the moral truths to tell people, you know? Yeah. And, and so we need that. And, and I would like to see, I mean, I know a lot of people are working on that problem, you know, like Sam Harris is a famous uh, yes. atheist writer. And <clears throat> he sees the confusion, but he doesn't see the, the way to organize the, uh, the morality. Yeah, speaking of Sam Harris, one of the most profound things that I took from reading The Moral Landscape is why he never brought up axiology. I mean, it blew me away. Half of that book is talking about axiological things, including that he says things that are axiological statements or supported axiological philosophic thinking, but yet never uses the word. It's like, did he even investigate that axiology? I mean, I if I if I ever get I haven't I haven't seen him yet, but I know what I want to ask him. Do you know what axiology is? That's all I want to ask him. Do you know what it is? And if he says no, then it, to me, then he is showing his limitation as a thinker. Yeah. Because you are addressing, especially when he says a statement. Well, one day that um you know science will be involved in morality. I'm like, it already has been. It's called formal axiology. What are you talking about? Do you not yeah. know that? Yeah. Do you not know yeah. that? It, it not only it's been empirically. Um, that's why um, we talked about. I don't remember his name now. Lelum, Palalum or something like that, right? The, um, he wrote the book of the new psychology of axiology or something like that. I don't know that book. Anyways, he um, he he basically has uh, the book is about how um, psychology needs to use axiology. That really. Oh, I see. And, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So he died in a car accident. It doesn't matter. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he died. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to talk to him oh, too. I, I would have got out a video with that guy because I guarantee I would. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like I like his stuff too. 
And so, sure. um, but he, he's already dead. But anyways, he, I will also like it because I have a psychology degree. So I think about psychology along with the philosophy or, or axiology. So because yeah. of him, um, what it does is uh, it allows, you know, uh, me to um, have more empirical grounding, really all axiologists, because he studied axiology. I think it was in five or eight countries. I can't think eight yeah, countries. Yeah, Pomeroy. Pomeroy is yeah, yeah. Name, right? Yes, yes. Correct. I, I couldn't remember the yeah. name. Yeah. But yeah, so he, um, but he empirically tested, you know, axi yes. axiology and Hartman's, uh, um, I think structure Hartman profile, value. Stru structure of value. And I think yeah. it was, uh, I think it was eight, eight countries in Europe, Japan or whatever, United States. And he was able to prove that no matter the culture, remember, this is important because Asian cultures are, um, communalistic almost in sense, yeah. or communitarian, yeah. and then most American or you know a lot of European ones are, c could be more individualistic. So, yeah. and then of course you have religion involved, the difference between I mean, Asian religions and then you know your Euro European religions or whatever Western religions. But but yeah. the axiology was the same. It was yeah. it was almost the it was not hundred percent same, but I mean it was close enough that you can say that we can judge that humans axiologically think a certain way. Axiologically. Yeah. I mean, we just, we can look at it and see the behavior. We know what they're doing. And then also that there's... Back, yeah, that goes back to the biology that we were talking correct. about. Correct. They're the, limited to biology. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The moral emotions. You can't it's get human. outside of it. And more, well, moral emotions happen yeah. because it's a social bonding technique in a sense. Uh -huh. Morality is a social. It helps us have social cohesion. Morality does. Yeah. So yeah. to me, it's so it's 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 automatic. I mean, animals know how to do it. I mean, it, to, what do, when do you start doing morality? Um, when you were born, yeah. <laughs> when you became an aware being, and that's when. When you became an aware being, you started do, making very limited but moral decisions. You started looking at your world, assessing it. In fact, they already know that there's studies that that prove that um, a baby lab. That um, a child as young as six months is actually making limited moral decisions. So we know that it, it could, we didn't need axiology to build it and make the more, more reasoning, more, um, you know, less error and more beneficial, obviously. But it just shows but that it just shows it, it's not religion. It's not God. <laughs> I mean, you're, in a sense, biology. Well, but we look at animals. They know how to act. You can even if you teach them, they understand how. I mean, it. We, we, we socially condition quite well, actually. And that's what a lot of that, but, but we know, you and me know that social ethics can't be the limit to what it is. It has to be reasoned and it has to have principles. It can't just be mm -hmm. this loose haphazard. And that's the other thing that, um, the Christian, the last question is, what about whatever works? You know, it says, why can't we just have a whatever works, you know, determine morality standard? Because that wouldn't work. That's why. <laughs> it wouldn't. Because, well, once again, I would say as an, uh, um, slowing down, what do you mean by works? So do you mean by human flourishing? Because that's what I would say if you ask me about. Because when you say whatever works, you mean whatever works in society, right? That's what you're meaning by that thing. Whatever works in society. Well, society then is what? It's not an, uh, an ontological being. It's a bunch of people. <laughs> so you're saying that you're working well with a bunch of people, right? That, that, mm -hmm. So that already means that we would have to say, well, it, only things that work well could be in the classification of what it works, which would then limit how many moralities we could say work, which means you and could. And for a while, slavery worked. <laughs> Right, but in a right. sense, it yeah, whatever right. Whatever works, they had slavery. That worked for a while. <laughs> well, it only, it only <laughs> yeah, that's no good. Well, also, that only worked for the people that were slave owners. That wasn't so well working yeah, for the slave. Well <laughs> They're like, well, yeah, why don't you want slavery? Um, I don't know. I have to justify that. I mean, why does anyone want slavery? It's really as simple that we want human freedom. But once again, that's understanding that humans have the right to human freedom and they have value and that you should then assess it and go, okay, they have value and we should be, you know, um, basically following, you know, uh, the William Kellerman, you know, principle that hum humans always have a um, right to respect and... Um, <laughs> 
Positive um, regard. Probably, positive regard. I should remember that because Carl Rogers, man, the unconditional positive yeah. regard. But I remember attacking him and going, see, unconditional positive regard, if you say it the way he's saying it, you're always nice in a sense to a person. I, 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 but I didn't understand. See, what he means is we can turn things. So that's a, he's doing what you're saying, but in a behavioral way. You're talking uh-huh. in a concept way. The, the value yeah. of he is in a behavior, which I didn't understand. I also I think too that when people say stuff like it, it's it's easy to put everything together, like behavioral concept. You know, once again, to me, humans love to generalize. Our minds are lazy. We like just <laughs> we want what's the simple, simplest, not the complicated. Well, life is complicated. Simple sometimes is not even a, even the what's valuable. <laughs> the complicated, you know. So, but. It's amazing, though. We know that we need complicated, like science. But when we go to morality, we want, like you know, like the cliff notes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I really appreciate, you know, that you not doing the cliff notes. I really appreciate, you know, people out there that are pushing, you know, that we need to assess things and start having some real morality happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I really enjoyed uh, talking with you. It Definitely was, uh, exciting. And uh, uh, you raised a lot of great issues. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed this. is This has been one of my um, funnest uh, um, interviews because I get to talk to someone who I feel really understands what I'm talking about. Oh, it's... yeah. 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 Well, that's good. All right. Dave. All right, man. I really appreciate it. And oh. have a nice day. And I will, I will post in this. And you might be looking for some friends. Oh, all right. That'd be great. I can always use some more friends. All right, man. Okay. Bye. Okay, David. Bye.